she's a solo practitioner and she started practicing when she was 10. So ignore the fact that she's been practicing for 26 years because that does not tell you her age. <laughs> <laughs> um, she, she is our resident mental health guru who works very closely with Judge Ellis. She does the competency restoration docket. She um, does uh, mental health. Um, she's part of the Mental Health National Alliance team. I'm messing that up, but okay. Um, RIT court, veterans court, probate court, guardianships. She's part of the CJC Mental Health Standing Committee. She does like to travel. So we uh, moved her from tomorrow to today because we would otherwise not be able to hear her. So please welcome her. Can y'all hear me? I'm not sure this is working. Now can you hear me? Is this working? Can you hear me now? Oh, wow. Okay, is that too loud? Sounds really loud to me. So my name is Stacy Bigger. I think I know probably 75 to 50% of y'all. So um, I don't know how this thing works either. Is this working? And nothing is working. <laughs> how do I? Anyone, anyone? Hmm. I may need, oh, there. And I am probably like the opposite of the last speaker. Um, PowerPoints are not my thing, and so I d it looked fine at home, but it doesn't look so great here. So, um, so basically, what is competency? A lot of people will come and say, um, I, to me, I thought it was something very obvious. I had a lawyer about two weeks ago come and tell me, how do you deal with these incompetent cases? Everybody's such an idiot. <laughs> and I was like, oh, uh, you're pretty well-known attorney that does a lot of pretty serious cases and apparently you don't realize that there's an association with mental illness. Um, and so basically, um, just because you're mentally ill doesn't necessarily mean that you're incompetent, right? So when you're looking at whether or not somebody is incompetent, you're looking at the legal definition of incompetence. And so basically you want to know whether or not they have the present ability to consult with their lawyer um, with a reasonable degree of understanding or if they have a rational and factual understanding of the proceedings against them. Um, a lot of times people do only think that competency really goes with um, mental illness. However, um, I've found in my practice at least that just because you're incompetent or I think that you're incompetent doesn't necessarily mean that you're mentally ill, right? So you could be, you could have an access, well actually you don't even have to have uh, access one diagnosis, schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression, but you could also be IDD or what they used to refer to as mentally retarded. Um, you could have a personality disorder. What I found um, in dealing with a lot of my veterans um, and not even with my veterans, I think it's more and more common that you could have a traumatic brain injury and the injuries associated with that are obviously usually not as well documented and it's much more difficult to actually realize that that person is having cognitive difficulties in understanding what you're saying and doing. I also have found that as um, our population is getting older and older that we have a lot of dementia and a lot of Alzheimer's and that sort of thing. And so you'll see somebody who gets arrested um, later in life and you think that this is very odd behavior and things are very, doesn't really make sense. But the reality is is that um, dementia has set in or Alzheimer's has set in. Um, the thing about, well, first of all, I'm sure most all of y'all realize how common it is to have mental illness or things like that in the jail, right? So this is a CLE so that we can get all our hours to do our court appointments, um, which means that the majority of us spend a lot of time with indigent defendants and defendants in the jail. So 25% of the jail has a mental illness. So when you're starting to develop your cases, even if you don't think that that person is going to be incompetent or maybe you have an idea they might be incompetent, trying to build up um, their, their case in that area isn't 
always just because you're going to do it for competency, but you also might be doing it for mitigation purposes. Um, maybe you're looking at taking somebody that they may not think is probation eligible, explaining as to why that person's deserving of probation. Um, it may allow you to know what sorts of services or programs or things like that 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 person would be eligible for, or that you may be wanting to look at to resolve your case so that person wouldn't be incarcerated. Um, I think too that when you have the documentation and the prosecutor's able to, if the client's fine with you sharing most of it, which they usually are, um, you give the prosecutor something to document their file to think outside of the box, right? And so they're looking at um, why they did something different that they might not otherwise do. Um, and then obviously, um, if it does go to trial, you're gonna wanna use that in your punishment evidence. So, everybody, most people here probably know what a 1622 is. Everybody realizes there's a very large backlog in 1622s. Um, a 1622, in my opinion, doesn't give us um, as much information as the orange sheets used to give us, but it does give us some if we actually get a good one. Um, it's basically complying with the Sandra Bland Act, and it's, it's mandatory, and they have to do them in all cases, whether or not you're in custody or on bond. It can be a good place to start off with um, looking to see whether or not your client um, does have a mental illness. Um, I just said all that, sorry. Did it go or no? So um, it's not, obviously, a 1622 is never going to be enough to get you to competency, but it'll at least get you a little starting place where you can start looking at things, discussing things, starting to figure out um, is it going to be an issue in your case. Um, one of the things about the 1622 is that it is shared with the court and it is also shared with the DA's office. Um, I, this is, well, God bless you. So one of the things um, about looking at these cases, like especially if you're looking at 1622 and stuff like that, is that I don't think a lot of people realize that the Code of Criminal Procedure actually provides um, that if a, if a person is, has a mental illness or IDD and they're with a nonviolent offense, then they shall be given a PR bond. And I don't think that we utilize this very often. I've utilized it, but I don't know that we do that necessarily as a, as a group of defense attorneys. And so um, with that, most people can be treated on an outpatient basis, so you would have to be able to show that. So we have the Harris Center, which is our mental health provider here in Harris County. Um, they can make that they make their appoint. They obviously can't make a condition of bond that they take their medications or anything like that, but they can make a condition of the bond that they go to the Harris Center and they have an intake appointment and they see a psychiatrist and they cooperate with the Harris Center. Um, also, if you can show that these clients have done well on bond and are doing these sorts of things, then um, I've been successful a lot of times in saying, okay, well, we have them in the community. We have them doing what they need to do. We then, you know, if it's a case that could be dismissed, you know, what was our goal here? Was our goal to address the mental health problem? Is this person really have something that, that maybe um, we don't need to go further with the prosecution um, and we can show that this could lead to a dismissal, especially um, kind of an informal PTI-ish sort of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so when I, when I first start um, looking at my case, um, I look at a bunch of different other things from when I first get assigned. So obviously you're gonna look at the offense report. You know, if they're doing something on a bus or the metro or you know, it was an offense that ended up being a problem with a police officer. There's a lot of, of, of offenses or reports that are gonna kinda trigger you that this person may have a problem. Looking at their criminal history, if they've got 20 trespasses, you may have a good idea that that person has a mental health issue. Um, if 
my name is associated with one of their prior cases, <laughs> you might actually um, think that person might have a mental health issue. Um, look and see if they've been found incompetent before. Um, because the population in which I deal with, I end up getting people over and over and over again, right? And so when that happens, I'm always very surprised that I have clients that were never restored to competency and some other lawyer has pled them out on a misdemeanor or two uh, before they ever came back to me. And I'm like, wait, they were incompetent. They've never been restored. It's the state's burden to prove they're now competent. How could we have pled them out on something already? Um, and so it's a lot more common um, than people realize. And so I don't think that, they, that people are always going back to look to see um, were they restored or not, right? Um, especially if you see they went to a hospital and then there's a dismissal, there's a really good chance that they were actually never restored by the court. Um, looking at the orange sheet, the orange sheets aren't what they used to be, but they're still there in our portals. So at least you'll know that they had some handling, um, and it could be different than what it was before, but at least it's there and it's an indicator. And it's orange in our portal, so it should at least stand out a little bit. Um, looking at bond violations and other sorts of things from pretrial services, um, especially when it comes to like brain injuries and that sort of thing, I find that my brain injury people are no-shows a lot. Right? Because they don't remember to go th do things. They don't remember, um, their short term memory is really affected a lot of times. And so, with that, it can be the question of I mean, they're not, I think, I'm not saying that we do, but I think that there is a tendency to kind of just jump to the conclusion that they're just not meeting their responsibilities when further questions should be asked if maybe that there's a reason as to why they're not making these appointments or not doing things. Um, also ask where they're housed. The second floor of um, 1200 is the mental health floor. And if they're there, you know that there's a reason that they're there. I mean, if 25% of the jail has a mental health issue, that is only one floor that they could be on, then that person obviously has an issue that the jail has indicated that they need to have um, higher supervision while they're in the jail. Um, obviously, we talked about the 1622, and then um, also family witnesses, um, you know, those sorts of things. A lot of times, you'll see in a report or in a rip call or something like that, where the family is like, "Hey, look, you know, our intention was never for them to be arrested. Our intention was for the police to come out because we really didn't know what to do. We really wanted a mental health warrant, right?" And so I try a, a lot. Um, I'm on the advisory board for NAMI, which is the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. And so I try to educate families as much as I can to how to call for the right resource, what to provide to the resource when they're out there, um, and also even trying to provide the family with what they would need to give to the jail um, as a history. Because if they can fax over, my clients quite often are horrible historians about themselves, so if they can fax over the history, then my client will actually that's the best way they can do. If mama's just calling and mama's just calling and mama's just calling, they just don't want to hear that, right? So um, I have like a, a template that I give to families to try to help them communicate and it seems to be effective. Um, so obviously, um, we all talk to our clients. Um, sometimes, and I'm very guilty of it too, sometimes we talk a little too fast with our clients. We don't spend that, that initial amount of time that we probably should. Hi, nice to meet you. I was pointing to your case. Blah, 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 blah. Um, but I will say that I find that most of my clients really cannot hold it together for more than 20 minutes. So, um, and with that being said, is that if I have a client who is really mentally ill, um, they don't always want you to know that, right? There's stigma associated with it. They may not want to be medicated and they don't want to go back on medications. They don't want to be hospitalized again. They don't want to see doctors again. Um, and so sometimes they're not going to share that information with me. Um, and with that, I find I'm some, 
for the most part, I'm fairly approachable. And so I kind of find that they normally start to tell me things. And then about 20 minutes into it, it's like, did I tell you that these people are, you know, <laughs> following me and that the police are after me and the blah, 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 blah. So the, the 20 minute conversation, I think, um, or the 20 minute rule is what I call it, um, is very helpful. Um, obviously, their version of the offense, you know, my mother was taken over and she's not really my mother. Um, it's going to lead you to the impression that your client's mentally ill. Um, their social history, right? How far did you make it in school? Did you graduate from high school? Were you, God bless you, were you in regular classes? Um, you know, were you in the foster care system? Were you, um, did you go to college? You didn't finish college. Have you been employed? How long, you know, how long were you employed? What you find a lot of times is that people with chronic mental illness have a very difficult time maintaining employment. And so you could see them, you could think they're employable, you can they hire them, but then maintaining anything past three to six months is usually very uncommon. It can be an indicator that there's a problem there. Um, medical history. So have you, you know, have you had accidents in the past? Um, that was brain injury sorts of things. Um, when you're asking their history too, obviously also find out if they're a veteran, especially for women. Women do not share that information at all. And so you can, I can, I've had clients in the past that have been my clients for a substantial period of time and then they'll say something where I'm like, you're a vet? Oh wow, like why didn't you tell me this early on? We could have, I could have been hooking you up with services and we could have been doing all sorts of things. You know, at that point trying to find out, you know, did you have military sexual trauma? Um, were you deployed? Is there PTSD? Not all PTSD comes from deployment. Um, sometimes there's accidents and things that occur. And so um, really just trying to find out more where they went from. Um, if you do find out that they do have some sort of mental illness, trying to find out what medications they were in the past. Did you not like the medications? Did you stop taking the medications? Did you take the medications in the community? Have you been seeing your psychiatrist? Is it a private psychiatrist? Do you have insurance? Um, you know, who is your provider? Why did you stop? Um, substance abuse also goes hand in hand quite frequently. Um, and so a lot of times um, those co-occurring diagnosis um, or something that you're not real sure is that the mental illness or is that the drug addiction um, and and which one which one started which um, what else um, I also try to talk to them obviously you you know y'all know the basis of competency I mean do they understand what they're charged with do they um, do they understand the court system? Do they understand their punishment range? Do they understand a plea bargain? Do they understand a jury trial? Um, those sorts of things. And then obviously disabilities, you know, who are you living with? You know, you're not working. How are you paying your bills? Oh, you're on SSI. Oh, okay. So what, the SSI disability, is that a physical disability or is that a mental disability, right? All of these things lead you to the path um, that you're looking for when you're trying to determine whether or not um, your client has a mental illness that could lead to incompetency. So, um, So for some of the things, um, in the cognitive deficits, obviously, you're looking at memory, distorted sense of reality, um, orientation to time, place, and date, attention issues, um, and are they easy to redirect? Most of my clients are not easy <laughs> to redirect. I think um, all of y'all would agree. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to have patience with them. And so um, one of the things that we put on here is that when you talk just very simple, um, very direct, and really try to actively listen. Um, what else? Oh, the things that you're going to see that are very typical. You're going to have pressured speech or, or hurried speech, um, tangential in thought, they're a little like me, they can't, they have a little ADD, they can't stay anywhere, um, inappropriate tone, so sometimes they're just like talking to a zombie, and sometimes um, 
I mean, sometimes even our hypersexual clients that a lot of us women have to face in the back, um, you know, a lot of times that can be direct from a mental illness. Um, nonsensical speech, obviously, and then a lot of times, I mean, I had a client who, he had been in a lot of hospitals and so forth, and he's like, I get dismissal, ATW, ATW dismissal. I mean, he knew totally, right? Um, this is not their first time, so they'll use things about how, that are gonna give you clues that they're, they've been through this system before. Um, a lot of the medications sometimes will give them ticks, um, or they will, um, like their jaw, um, what else? So things like that that you can give you an indicator that um, you need to look more into all that. Uh, I think I already saw that. So, um, if you think your client is incompetent, then what do you do next? So most of the courts will use the Harris Center for their competency evaluation. Um, there's good and bad in that, and I use both. So sometimes I don't have a problem using the Harris Center um, in the jail. Sometimes they can actually have more information about my client, which I then request, because then that will give me their jail records. Um, they're able to see how many times they've been handled a process in the Harris Center through their own computer computer database and so forth. The judges usually won't ever give me a hard time about that because um, they're our mental health authority, they're in the jail, and it doesn't cost the court anything additional to use their service. Um, the problem with that is that right now it's currently about an eight week wait um, to get that report back and sometimes I don't want it to be that long, right? So, um, so if so it just kind of depends um, if I choose to use the Harris Center or not. I don't always use the Harris Center. Um, sometimes I might have, be a, I know my client's a vet and I can use the VA services. They have psychiatrists there also um, that I can utilize for competency or for sanity or for just basic building of a mental health case. I'll sometimes use those doctors. Um, but then sometimes I'll use an independent expert. I rarely, every now and then, have gotten pushback. Um, there's case law on point. They can't deny me an independent expert. And so um, once, they're, once the judge is pretty much just educated about that, um, I've always gotten an independent expert. It's not, after that, it's really not a problem. Um, to me, it just depends on what I'm trying to do with it, right? So. Um, I, I almost always use an independent if I think I'm gonna have a sanity issue because I want to use that same expert for both competency and sanity because I'm sure as y'all all know, you have to be competent before you can even do a sanity evaluation. And so it's faster, um, sometimes, um, I know more specifically what I'm looking for. I can share a lot more documents with my expert. Um, I've gotten to where I have a nice relationship between my investigator and my doctor and we can get documents and things and so forth um, easier to my independent than I could a hair center. Um, I spoke at a conference about a year ago and I said things about the evaluators in the jail. Um, it got back to them. I had to have a meeting with them afterwards to explain my misperceptions of the jail doctors. Um, and so if you contact them, they will look at all of your documents and your things. And so share those with them if you have them because they very much want to do a good job and will look at all your stuff. So hopefully if there's any jail forensic evaluators, psychologists in the audience, I've done my job. Um, <coughs> so, um, and if you think they're IDD, make sure and get all your school records. School records are so important. Um, really, without your school records, you're really never going to get there with the IDD. So, um, when you have your evaluation come back, obviously you want to have the determination of competency. So you want to know if they're made competent or incompetent. Um, you want to have a, a mental health diagnosis and then you want to know what the recommendation for treatment is going to be. So is it an inpatient recommendation, a hospitalization? Could it be an outpatient recommendation? Um, 
Some of y'all may or may not know this, but as of September the 1st, we were supposed to start the felony outpatient competency restoration program. Um, it, it hasn't started, um, but the money's there, the program's going to be there, and so that is, this will be the first time in the history of Harris County that we've ever actually had an outpatient competency restoration. Everything else in the past is because the outpatient competency restoration didn't exist, everybody had to go inpatient, right? So you're looking at going to Vernon, Rusk, San Antonio, Big Spring, Rio Grande, Kerrville, um, Austin, it's one of those state hospitals and then um, within the last, I, I want to say three to five years, we, um, we have now HCPC and HCPC does misdemeanors and then some state jail felony type cases and so um, the wait list for that is much shorter. The goal is to have these people that um, that are found incompetent, that can be out on bond, that don't have to have hospitalization. The goal is to create, they've created a program here that should address that, it's just the program hasn't really started. So I'm hoping that it starts before the end of the year. Um, so basically one of the things I wanted to make sure they all knew um, was that your competency evaluation can't be used against you in their case in chief, right? And so I try to make sure that my clients realize that um, for trial purposes, it, 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 it's not admissible. Um, and so it can really only be used for treatment and pre-adjudication purposes. Um, Obviously, they're not thinking properly if they're incompetent. And so what they're telling the evaluator um, should not be used against them um, because they don't, aren't, they don't understand what they're doing would be the argument. Um, also, I wanted to make sure that y'all knew that at any time in your proceeding, any time, even if you're in trial, you can raise the issue of competency. So I had a very bad experience earlier this year with a judge um, that um, when I, I'll, I'll talk about it in a bit, um, who I had to educate on this point, understanding that at any time in the procedure I can bring competency up. I think they think if you've gotten so far in that you're incompetent as an attorney because you did not realize that your client had these issues. So. Um, the evaluator can be called to testify um, at sentencing at, for mitigation if necessary, if that's something that you're wanting to do with your case. Um, for contested competency hearings, um, if they don't agree to it, you're gonna have to put on your evaluator. Um, if you can put in any medical records or treating physicians or psychiatrists before, um, family members can be used. Um, um, police officers, um, even jail personnel, um, any sort of staff or anything like that that seeing behavior can be used in, in contested competency hearings to show that the person doesn't understand um, the nature and consequences of the charges against them. Um, but kind of like what we were talking about before, once they have been found incompetent, um, they're put on a wait list to go to the state hospital. I don't think because the way the practice has been in the past that a lot of judges can even consider, like I've watched judges in regular courts, I guess, because I work so many specialty courts now, um, but in regular courts, um, I watch all the time that maybe they're out on bond and then they revoke their bond and they put them in jail. And I'm like, there's no reason for that. That doesn't have to be the case. Um, and so fortunately, um, Judge Ellis understands that, and if that happens and they get transferred to the competency restoration docket, please, um, we usually kind of figure it out, but please make sure that you tell whatever attorney is getting that case so that we can get that bond reinstated. Um, if they were doing fine before and they were there, then there is no reason why they couldn't continue out on bond if it's a nonviolent offense. Um, what else? So, um, the outpatient competency restoration. Um, there's also a misdemeanor program starting. I'm not sure. Nobody here. They're not sure if it's going to be through Judge Andrews' court. It's going to be the first misdemeanor mental health program down there. Um, I'm hoping it's the beginning of many, many more. I haven't figured out why we don't have more 
mental health misdemeanor programs. I've sat in a whole lot of meetings and it just never seems to get off the ground. So, um, what else? Um, kind of like I talked about before, um, one of the things too is that I think a lot of times if it's not a very serious offense, people won't do the evaluation because they're afraid that they're going to spend more time in, in custody or in a hospital than they would spend on their offense. And so just to make sure that people are aware, um, you cannot spend more time than the length of the maximum sentence. Okay, so I hate to say this about some of my brethren, but I've had cases transferred to us before on these specialized dockets, and um, like I had an NGRI transferred to us that um, terminated two years. He had been, he could have terminated, like his maximum, oops, sorry. his maximum sentence had ended, and he spent two extra years in the hospital. So I'm like, just make sure you realize that they, don't have to be there. Um, okay, so what happens is if they get to a hospital setting, then they have to have the initial commitment. Um, they have to have a reevaluation after 30 days that they're there. After the 30 days, if the commitment continues to show inpatient, then they get a commitment for 120 days. If after 120 days they're not restorable, then they're recommitted for an additional 180. If at the additional 180 they're still non-restorable, then they can be renewed for restoration um, for a one-year um, recommitment. So um, with that, it'll be really interesting to see that when we get the outpatient competency restoration, um, how that flows into things. One of the things that I don't know if people realize or not is that when you have somebody at HCPC, they can't do these these um, further these further commitments. And so instead of having the client come back to the jail, make sure that the CMEs are done while they're there at the hospital. If they're there at the hospital, you can have a video conference. You don't need to bring your client ever back from the hospital to the jail. I mean, obviously the jail is not healthy for anybody, right? So if I would have problems in the jail and I don't have any mental health issues. Our clients that we're trying to stabilize, trying to restore, if we can in any way not bring them back, we should never be bringing them back. Um, I don't know what people know and don't know. Um, but we do have a video conference room set up on the 20th floor right now. Oh, Lourdes can tell me she's in here. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Lourdes, I just saw you. Um, and so we do have a video conference room set up right now. Oh, and so is Roger. And so, no, Roger. So we have the video conference room set up. We can talk to all the hospitals from the video conference room. All you have to do is ask the judge for the video conference, um, schedule that. Um, he'll sign the order. Um, Normal will fax the order to the hospital and to the, the video people. Um, and then we have those conferences all the time. So there's, I mean, anybody that, in, I try my very, very best not to bench warrant anybody back to the jail that we can possibly um, avoid um, them having to come back to the jail. We spend all this time and all this money and all these resources trying to bring somebody stable and the jail only makes them decompensate. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the time limits you just mentioned don't include the wait period for No, sir. So, um, so that's one of the really big problems. So, sorry. The question was the time limits that I just said don't necessarily include the wait time in the jail to go to the hospital. So we've been trying like all these different ideas and things to try to do what we can to will away that wait time. Because as we all know, like I currently had, it was a bad uh, aggravated assault. Like he, um, he thought his mother, it's the one I'm gonna do sanity on, but he basically took an ax, hit his mom in the back of the head and caused like 75 stitches to the back of her head. And so he's obviously going to Vernon, right? So, cause he's a high risk client. It was a 15 month wait from the time of incompetence to the time that he got to Vernon, right? So with those also, um, 
sometimes people think that, okay, well, they're on the wait list, so they're gone, right? And the court will let me know when I need to be back here or whatever. Um, with those people, I mean, if you're spending 15 months on the second floor of the Harris County Jail getting medicated and seeing doctors and nurses, you may be restorable, right? So you may want, I mean, I'm not telling you how to practice law, but make sure and check in with that person. Make sure and visit that person. Make sure and email the people on the second floor because your client may need to just be seen by the doctor in the jail and they've, because they've been on meds for so long, now they're restored. And then you can go forward with your case. And all the information that we just talked about can be used to manage that case in a different way. But the answer is no. And we've made a bunch, Patty, Sedita has tried very hard to make the argument and has done a lot of research and a lot of briefing as to if Harris, Harris County is the largest psychiatric hospital in this, or the Harris, the Harris County Jail, right. It's not a psychiatric hospital. So that's our whole, that's why I hesitated because our whole argument is you're getting psychiatric treatment there. There are, our mental health authority is there actively working in the jail. But the distinction is that it's not a hospitalization. And so that's where the, and so that's why I stepped back before I said hospitalization because that's Patty's whole, oh sorry, that's Patty, I'm talking about my hands. That's Patty's whole argument is that why are we not counting that as commitment? And why are we not doing compensatory restoration inside the jail, right? So anyway, that's all I'm talking about. Yes, ma'am. So if you go and your client is incompetent waiting to go to the hospital mm -hmm. and you do happen to go check in and believe that they are now competent, what is the vehicle to get them back in court and... You're going to file for another evaluation. <laughs> okay. So you're you just going to... Yeah. Or an order uh, is... No, you're going to have a new evaluation. Okay. All right. Because so at any time you can ask for another evaluation, right? Okay. So at that point you would just ask for them to be re -eval. Because it could be different. Right. 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 And that's a way to maybe expedite the procedure if you think right. they could right. go ahead and take some take responsibility maybe. Right. However that's gonna look. Right. Right. So um and that could be a lot of different things. And maybe then, I mean, it would depend. If it's a low, I would argue, PR bond and see if we could get them services outside, right? Um, because now they're competent. But, so, yes, thank you, Sally. Right, exactly. So, competency restoration and like to restore. Thank you, Lourdes. <laughs> So what happens a lot of times too is kind of what I talked about at the beginning, right? So they go to a hospital or, um, and they're not restorable. And so the hospital is like, hey, look, we, they've gone through restoration classes because that's exactly what restoration is. They have medication compliance. They've gone through restoration classes. They are not restorable. They're not going to regain, right? So it could also be that maybe they're not mentally ill. It's a brain injury. And that brain injury is not going to be restorable and that they, you have a neuropsychiatrist who says um, this is a permanent brain injury and they're unlikely um, to be restored to competency. With that, um, what we do a lot in Judge Ellis's court, and you can, this could be done anywhere, is if once we find out that they're unlikely to be restored, then we ask for a PR bond straight from the hospital. So that way they don't go back to the jail. So asking for a PR bond straight from the hospital, if possible, um, working because once you go to a hospital, you're eligible for FACT services. FACT is the highest level of, or can be the highest level of care at, at the Harris Center. And so with that, um, you're going to have somebody who's out there dispersing the medications. Um, they'll actually meet them at the eligibility center. They can take them to where their placement or housing would be. Um, they'll take them to their first doctor's appointment. They'll leave with a script from the jail or a script from a hospital. Um, they'll help them fill that script, um, things like that. Um, I, I, this is kind of my stick. This is my thing is get them out of the community, get them set up, give the state reassurances that we've done all we can do and then get a dismissal. Obviously on a non-restorable person, what are they gonna do? They can't go forward, they're not restorable, they're not competent, they're stuck. So um, 
Now, if they come back competent, um, then always look also to the felony mental health court or the CTI mental health court. So the differences between the two is the felony mental health court that Judge Thomas does is basically for people um, who have um, are kind of like the first timers, right? So they're initial pro they're initially being placed on probation and they've never actually been to a psychiatric. They didn't come from a state hospital. For the CTI mental health court that Judge Ellis does, um, m most of those probationers are probationers that came either straight from the state hospital, and so they're from the state hospital and a, pro a probation is appropriate. They're competent, they come from a hospital, probation is appropriate, or they were in another court where they were placed on probation. Maybe they were um, being supervised by the mental health um, initiative through probation and they were not successful mainly because of their mental illness. So with that, then um, Judge Ellis's court tries to take that mentally ill person that everybody knows is not appropriate for jail, probation would be appropriate, but they need a much higher level of supervision. Um, and then always try, to, I do, I probably need a lot more informal pretrial interventions than actual paper pretrial interventions, but um, I, I try to do a lot of those too if I can keep them from being felons that might actually affect their benefits and some other things in the future. Um, and then obviously brain injuries, dementia. If you have Alzheimer's, I mean, you're not, you're not going to be restorable. Unfortunately, your life is probably getting worse before and not ever really getting better. So, um, and then last but not least, you could ask for a dismissal and a civil commitment in a state hospital. So basically, you go from a forensic bed in a state hospital to the other side of the hospital, which is a civil commitment bed. You used to see that a whole lot, but nowadays, there's not as much of that. There's, those are really pretty extreme cases. I would see, I see a lot more with that with like my sex offenders or my very, very violent offenders that are just never regaining. So this is the case I kind of told y'all about. Okay, if we could do, I was gonna give you like case studies or I can just answer questions. So I don't know which one you wanna do. But, so this is my brain injury person that I, um, I um, had the problem with the judge. So, um, he was always agreeable. Like he is the most agreeable human being you will ever meet in your entire life. And so um, it was not apparent at all that he had a brain injury. And so he didn't have massive scars on his head. Um, he had a lot of violations on pretrial. Um, the judge took him into custody. It was kind of almost like, it, I wouldn't say forced plea, but um, we put him on probation, um, th knowing he was gonna go into custody for all these bomb violations, right? Um, once he started that, um, that's, and he had told me, um, we had talked about employment, we had talked about all these other things, and he was like, no, I lost my job last year, I was in a car accident. And I heard it, but I didn't really go further with it. And, and like I said, he's super agreeable. Um, very nice, always polite. And so once he started probation, his stepmother called me and said, there's absolutely no way he can do this. Um, he, 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 he can't keep up with all these appointments. He was in a coma for six, for six weeks. Um, I, they showed me the article, they showed me the clip from TV. I started, and so I filed a motion for a new trial. Um, and so I filed a motion for a new trial um, that um, I didn't have the information that I had before, that I did not think he was competent at the time to take the plea, that I had gotten new information. Um, the judge was very, very, very upset. It, at me, um, threatened to grieve me. Um, it was very ugly, and so, and so, it, oh, there's a hole up here, um, and so, um, ultimately, the motion for a new trial was granted. Um, he was found to be incompetent and not restorable by my neuropsychiatrist. The state then did a second evaluation, which confirmed what I thought. Um, and so ultimately, um, they've had to dismiss his case, which nobody was very happy about. So um, this is just like an orange sheet that can give you some ideas. But if you see on my orange sheet, it said um, 
it said post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, but it didn't have any sort of cognitive until he ended up going back into custody on the 26th, but we got him out really fast. Um, this is another case that I had um, where she was found to be incompetent. So this is basically, um, she had had a case in which she represented herself and actually got a not guilty, um, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, and so, but afterwards, she felt like she had been treated so badly, and she had such a um, skewed vision of the of the criminal justice system that she went on to harass every single person involved in it. The like this is a crazy case because. I knew very well every single complainant in the case. Um, and so she went on Facebook, um, she hacked into their emails. I mean, she's super smart, highly intelligent. She has a master's degree. I mean, she's not what you would initially think, right? And so, and she's a 20 minute rule. Like, she seems okay until 20 minutes into it, then you're like, whoa. Um, and so, um, so anyways, and so um, she obviously got charged with harassment. Um, she had four charges of harassment, two misdemeanors and two felonies. Um, she ultimately did go to, um, to the state hospital. Um, we got a special judge appointed to the case um, because none of the judges wanted to deal with her because she had already harassed the previous judges so much. Um, so it was really interesting. Um, but they had no problems giving her to me, letting her harass me. Um, and so, but she was ultimately found competent. Um, we have placed her on a PTI. Um, and so because she is highly educated and maybe someday she might have a future doing something else. Um, I will say in this particular case, um, the complainants were all very understanding about the mental health. Um, we were really um, fortunate to be able to convince all of them that um, what we were doing was the right thing. And then, is just the people that keep coming back. And so, um, I mean, I literally have probably a dozen clients that are just not restorable. And they just pick up case after case after case after case. And so the problem is, is that we send them back to hospitals and then the hospital says they're not restorable and they should be supervised out patient in the community, they're charged with ugly offenses, we put them in the community, they run off, they come back. I don't know the answers to these people, um, but but if you see somebody's case that was dismissed and my name's on it, please check to see if they had a comp C though. Um, there's my email, that's my cell phone. Don't call me, text me, I'll text you back. Um, I only talk to my mom and my kids, that's it. So. Is Damon Parrish here? Hey guys, uh, while we got a quick moment, uh, I want to thank everybody for being here, and I also want to give a shout out to TCDLA. So TCDLA is a huge sponsor of this program. Um, all the food is free, everything here is free, and that's why it's free, because they've helped pay for it. So if you have the time, I would ask any and everybody, if you're not a member of TCDLA, to stop out and sign up. Amongst other benefits of cool CLEs that are free, we have the Strike Force. And if anybody know what the Strike Force is? No. Some of y'all are good. So I'm a member of the Strike Force. Mark Bennett right there is chairman of the one of the Strike Forces. One of the things we do in the Strike Force is if you're in, tro in trial or you're in court and you find yourself in the crosshairs of a judge, you can call us up and we'll come help you out. Uh, we respond all the time, and that's just a member perk benefit of TCDLA. There are more as well, but I would ask everybody, if you are here, 
if you practice criminal defense, uh, to consider joining TCDLA, which is the Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, and to further the cause of criminal defense in Texas. All right, guys? So thank you, and enjoy the CLE, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Oh, she in turn. Okay. Gotta see some. Our next speaker is Kenneth Harton. Before joining the Harris County Public Defender's Office about four months ago, Kenneth was a supervising attorney at the Orleans Public Defender's Office in New Orleans, Louisiana, where he practiced during the last eight and a half years. If y'all see him in the hallways, will y'all please remind him he's in Texas now? Yeah. Right? And that we say Vordire and not Vordire. 
<laughs> being not giving in to that. <laughs> being born and raised in Louisiana, he received his undergraduate degree from LSU before graduating, finally coming over to Texas and graduating from Thurgood Marshall School of Law here in Houston. Kenneth has handled and tried several cases over the past nine years, including but not limited to drug, burglary, robbery, murder, rape, you know, the regular stuff we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Over the last five years, Kenneth has shifted his focus on increasing community awareness regarding the negative implications of mass incarceration, which was featured on BET's The DA versus Black America. And he's also made an appearance on 60 Minutes with Anderson Cooper in April of 2017, discussing the impact of underfunded, underfunded public defender offices. And clearly, Harris County is doing well in that regard. Um, last year, Kenneth most recently co-hosted a full day seminar for the NFL and New Orleans Saints on challenges that public defenders have in changing the narrative. Most recently in August of this year, Kenneth was the recipient of the 2019 Stephen B. Bright Public Defender Award, which is a national award given annually in recognition to attorneys on their contribution to improving the quality of indigent defense. We're very glad to have him at the PDO and I'm happy to introduce to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all can hear me well? Yeah. I'm not really a podium guy, so I kind of like to walk around a little bit. But unlike our last speaker, Stacy, I know she said she knew about 75% like, of the room. I probably know more like 5 to 10% of the room. But <laughs> nonetheless, I'm here and I have the challenge of speaking to everyone after they've already eaten. And then we have about an hour and a half. So I know that you're challenged by the itis, you're challenged by a lot of distractions, cell phones, emails coming in. So that being said, I want to warn you ahead of time. I like to make my slides a little interesting, a little different. Sometimes they consist of things I like, some things you identify with, some things you don't, so bear with me because it's more of a sorry I'm not sorry type of situation. So hopefully, if nothing else, you'll be interested to see what happens next. So on this subject that we're talking about, uh, when we're dealing with relationships, right, some of you may say, well, why relations? Well, look at everything that we have and everything that you've been going over today and tomorrow. Skill-centered trainings, right? We may be going over voir dire. We may be going over opening statements. We may be going over litigation, pretrial litigation, motions in limine. The one thing that all of these things have in common is the client. None of, thing, none of these things would exist without a client. And the better your client relationship is, the better and more effective your representation is going to be. So when we talk about relations, are we talking about parent-child? No, right? Obviously, that's important. But it's, not, it's a little bit different than a client relationship. Are we talking about friend to friend? Obviously not. And by the title suggests relations, we're certainly not talking about any type of romantic relationship. Okay? So when we're talking about, client, when we're talking about this idea of relationship, we're talking about a client-centered relationship. Developing a healthy client relationship and keeping you and your client on the same team. And what I intend to do is talk through some of the stereotypes that some of you may have encountered throughout your practice and how we're going to overcome those hurdles, right? So that being said, some of you may think client relationship means client interviewing, right? I personally do not use the term client interviewing um, because if you think of it that way, this is going to be very boring to you. Many of you know how to speak with a client, you know how to speak with people, right? But we want to focus on getting quality information from the client that we may need, particularly at the beginning of the representation, and how to get clients to trust us to give that information. So what we're going to do is identify the hurdles that impact healthy client relationships and discuss how to overcome them. Again, but before we even start with anything, right? Obviously, this training is going to be centered a little bit more public defender oriented. Obviously, we're co-sponsoring this. But some of you have either been a public defender, client appointed, defense attorney, defense bar. You all encountered the same type of challenges. So I want you to think through some of these things that you're encountering and think about what you identify with and some of the, things, some of the ways that you may overcome them. Right? But let's start with the obvious question. Do clients trust us? Y'all could just shout out yes, no, maybe so. Of course not. I heard no, of course not. Some of you may nod and say, yeah, I got the swag to get a client to trust me. But 
the fact is, predominantly the way, and especially the way we're portrayed, sometimes it's hard, right? It's hard for clients to trust us because we're meeting them in their worst case scenario. We're meeting them at the worst time of their life. Or we're focused on how TV portrays us, right? TV portrays us always this slick back type of situation, admitting all kind of rules that will never exist in real life. And so many times we're set up where we're at a disadvantage from the very beginning. So clients don't trust us, right? Why not? Can you think of some of the stereotypes that we may have? Liars. Liars. Anything else? Money hungry. Money hungry. Working, for them. Working for them. By them, who do you mean? The state. Exactly, exactly. For the sake of time, I'll go through a few of them. Maybe some of you identify with one. Maybe some of you identify with all of them. So a few of them are believe we align with the court, the court and the state. Someone said that, right? That we're all part of the same team, right? Believe we're incompetent, right? Basically trusting the jailhouse lawyers. Or that my, sister, my sister's brother's auntie has an attorney, and they told me this, but they practice in real estate. No offense to real estate lawyers, but we're talking about criminal defense, right? For my PDs, more specifically, we're PDs because we couldn't get a job anywhere else, right? Some of the other things, believe we don't care. We got other stuff to do. We're more focused on that Blackberry or that cell phone or whatever the case may be, right? Believe we think they're guilty. Believe we think they're guilty. We read the report, for some reason we just credit this source of the report as the Holy Bible, not to offend those who don't believe in the Bible, but you get the analogy, and then all of a sudden we've warded it off as you're screwed, right? Believe we think they're guilty, or believe we don't fight as hard for them if we think they're guilty. So some of these are stereotypes that we have going into a relationship. We may not see them because we're so goal-focused and we're thinking about how we have to hurry up, get this information, go before the judge, set a bond, or get this information started for investigation or to resolve. So we're not thinking about sometimes how the client process does it. I'm not saying that that means we're not good lawyers. It means that we are not, we're human beings. And sometimes we get caught up in this ruckus that's going from here to there, here to there. So what this training is geared to do is to get you to stop and think for a second and rethink some of the things that a client may be experiencing, some of the things that they may be seeing, and making sure that we're not doing anything to reinforce that. Everything you do is either reinforcing a stereotype or breaking down one. So you want to consider those things. More specifically with public defender stereotypes, what are some of the ones you've heard? I want to see if I, I can hear a new one. What, what was that? Overworked and underpaid. Overworked and underpaid. Public pretender. We, we got all kind of remixes on them. That's a good one. Student loan. Student loan forgiveness. But that doesn't work for all schools. Point me to the direct. My, my law school didn't. But, but that is true. Right? But some of the stereotypes we hear, plea lawyer, free lawyer, law clerk, public pretender, I've even heard public offender. So just, and usually with, with CLEs or any type of presentation I've been a part of, I never like to share a horror or war story. So I'll share one brief thing, one brief situation, how sometimes a stereotype is cemented in someone's brain. It was a simple burglary of an inhabited dwelling, which would probably be a burglary habitation here, right? And an aggravated assault with a firearm. About three or four days of trial, we actually, we got it not guilty. I'm not gonna discuss the skills or the sets or how we got there, but the point being, the client turns to me and says, you know, I'm so happy, thank you, giving me the whole bear hug, and it says, you know what, you're gonna make a real good lawyer one day when you graduate from law school. So, the three days that I've spent doing this litigation, the times I've met in meeting with him, we never had a bad relationship, but that was in his brain of what I am, right? and what I can be according to his brain. I appreciate the sentiment, but nonetheless, that is what a lot of people think. And that is sometimes the battle that all of you, in whatever regard, even if it's not public defense, no matter what age, no matter what stage you're in, you're gonna have to go through that, and you're gonna be dealing with that, whether it's an age factor, whether it's a geographic factor, you're gonna be dealing with challenges where your expertise may be minimized. So how do we handle some of these things? So developing high, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a healthy client relationship is basically about getting the quality of information from the client, right, and being able to use it because it's directly correlated with the strength of that, but more importantly, getting that trust factor from the client. So in thinking of this, one of the things I want to suggest is, now some of these suggestions that I'm going to say, some of you may flat out disagree with, and I understand that. 
right? It's just a consideration. It's just some things to think, right? And one of the things that I like to say is I like to avoid the mechanics of simply interviewing, right? So if I'm sitting here and I meet a client, your name, age, military, uh, you're from here. Now, I know in the context of bond hearing, sometimes in, in urgent circumstances, that can be very, very challenging. And at the end of this presentation, I'll talk about how sometimes we can preserve that even in time crunch scenarios, okay? But in this, in this regard, consider, instead of the normal checklist, just how you speak to someone, how you start their day, how you start what this person has just gone through, you have no idea. And here we come with our checklist, hello, name. What does that sound like? A police interrogation that may have happened two days before you came and saw them. Or maybe a family member that's rejected them. What did you do? Why did you do it? Who are you with? Right? You may have had that kind of issue. And then they come and see you, the person that's supposed to be fighting for them. Right? And, I'm not, and I know we're all good hearted, and sometimes we get caught in the mechanics, but it's just stopping for a moment and just taking that consideration. So consider your intro. If you're asking a client, I know sometimes how are you is a bit bleak. If they're already in jail, what do you think, right? But, you know, look, aside from the circumstances, aside from being here, how are you holding up? Right? Consider word choice. Maybe their grandmother just passed away. Maybe they have something in two days that they know they can't be a part of. And just taking a moment and being in that moment with them can change. Can change things and can start your representation off in a powerful way, right? Talking about checklists, right, if you can, scripts, right, just drinking in information, just drinking in what you're seeing, what you're observing in that client. It may even connect to what Stacy was talking about with competency. You may observe some things about this client that may go towards some of these signals from the very beginning. So drinking these things in and learning that, right? Think about in the context of going on a date. You're observing that person, right? You're observing if they have teary eyes and they're meeting you somewhere, you might so, hey, what do you want for a drink? You're not gonna necessarily start off a conversation like that, right? So you wanna think about that in the context of with your client. Word choice, and we'll get a little bit into that. And I mean legalese, right? Using too many law terms, assuming a client knows things, even if they've been in TDC multiple times, even if they've been in state jail multiple times. A lot of times we're using, so you know this, you know the lingo, you've been through this before, but you never stop to assume that maybe they don't have the representation sitting before them. Maybe they didn't have the person that talked them through, right? So taking time and making sure that that client understands what's going on. Not, not that they're stupid, but just there's a lot of lawyers that don't understand all the legal terms that's associated with our practice. So so making sure they know that. And natural conversation. If someone had just told you that their mother just died, don't sit there and be like, so this aggravated robbery charge, I want to talk about this charge. Uh, it's a $20,000 bond. How do you, you know, you, know, you want to take a moment and acknowledge that person and acknowledge them for who they are. Just like you, they're a human life. You don't want to be like this, which was a very funny movie, by the way. Um, <clears throat> Consider your body language. 90% of communication is nonverbal. So if you are sitting down, again, from the very beginning, if you're sitting down, and what does this suggest? Whenever you meet your client and you give them the church finger, what does that suggest? What, what does this suggest? Right, or this. Right? What do those things suggest? So you want to think about these things. Clients are paying attention to everything you do. Everything you do is reinforcing a stereotype or breaking down one. So consider that. Think about what stereotype that you may be reinforcing before you even speak. Now, the good thing, the good thing is we talked about some of these stereotypes, but perceptions can change. They can change, and with work and with recognition of who you're dealing with and where you are and how that client may feel about what you do, you can go from this, Steve Rogers, to, you already know it's coming, Captain America. If you haven't guessed it yet, I am a Marvel fan. Call me a geek, call me a freak, call me whatever you want. I love it. I can't wait till the next one comes out. But some of the other obstacles that we want to think about overcoming is by first thing, knowing your trade. What we have, whether you consider it a skill, whether you consider it an art, regardless of what you consider, it's something that we've all worked for, 
right? Our client deserves to know what's going on, right? So this means knowing the charges, whether it's the first, second degree, knowing the penalties, knowing how the enhancements may or may not affect that, right? Knowing the defenses, potential defenses, not necessarily locked into one defense, but some of the potential defenses that are out there, right? Knowing the legal concepts, attorney-client privilege, the dangers of talking on the jail calls, and how they can be used against you, how we have literally no control against them at times, right? Talking about procedural information, the period of indictment, how indictments work, right? The time period of that, Knowing what to expect that. If it is a more serious charge, you know that that time period is going to be a little bit longer, right? Even though it may be a difficult conversation to have, at least it's already putting that client with an expectation of what could or may happen, right? The documents, reports. Now, obviously, you can't give clients discovery here, which was completely bizarre to me because it's the client's file, but I understand it. But still having them understand what are some of the things that are against that client. Right? What are some of those things that are against that client and keeping them aware? So knowing your trade, educating your client. Right? So a scenario. Some of these scenarios I'll just hurry up and read through for the sake of time. Uh, but lawyer sits down to meet with client charged with assault with a bottle. The client has been adamant that the victim identified the wrong guy and that he wasn't there. The lawyer has fingerprint report from the lab that shows that the client's fingerprint was found on the bottle collected at the scene. The client says that the report is wrong. The lawyer says, look, you obviously aren't being truthful with me. This fingerprint evidence is never wrong. Now, I don't know if that's familiar to y'all. I don't know if you've had a situation like that where there's DNA or fingerprints. So the situation like that can be very difficult when you get information that's going directly contradicting to what your client wants to forward, right? So you want to consider about how to approach this situation. And for the, I, I think, I fear that I may rub against the 45 minutes, so I may name, I may just give suggestions just to, um, just to save time. Huh? Take all the time, all the time you need. <laughs> I want to respect everybody's time because I want to. I see nodding faces and stuff, so I want to be mindful of that. Um, so this kind of conversation could be very, very difficult to have, and I acknowledge that, right? I acknowledge that. But you want to make sure and think through things and share that with that client, right? Maybe they're adamant that this report is wrong. This report is wrong. Blah 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 blah. This is horrible. This is bad, right? Think about what your role is. You are not the fact finder. You are not the fact finder. Our job, um, well we, we are not the fact finders, right? Our job is to reach the desired outcome, reach the, the most desired outcome given the circumstances. We're not there to judge guilt versus innocence. So really, you may be saying, you may have to, a conversation to your client may go like this. Look, I don't know if this fingerprint evidence is right or wrong. I don't know. What we need to be concerned about is how the jury may see this, how the jury may take this. So we may need to reconsider some of our options of how the jury may look at that. If, you know, so here's some routes. If we're looking at the report, then maybe one route could be we're going to challenge the report with our own expert. Now, some of you may say, I don't have the resources for that. Some of you may come from offices where you don't have the resources for that. So maybe your conversation may be exploring other theories, right? In case this DNA report is very believable or this fingerprint report is very believable. Right? Having different conversations as opposed to this, right? The fingerprint evidence is never wrong, right? Those kinds of things. So you want to be very, very considerate and intentional about how you go about forming that strategy and communicating that to your client. Um, and think about, I meant to say, think about with that example, what stereotype is that reinforcing, right? Fingerprint evidence is never wrong. It means that you already think that they're guilty. Right? And think about how that client could be perceiving that. I'm sorry, Eric, I probably was standing all in your way. <laughs> uh, show clients that you are willing to presume them innocence. Not because necessarily you just love every single client, because some clients are very difficult to get along with, but because you're standing up for what our law is. You're giving them the same presumption that our law affords them, right? So you want to be considerate of that. Separate yourself from the system. So what do I mean by that? Asking questions that assume guilt. You have a report, and let's say that Eric Davis is the uh, listed victim. I don't even like using the term victim because uh, victim assumes conviction. Uh, if it hasn't been proven yet, right? If it's been proven, burden's been met, there's a conviction, they become a victim. Until then, they're a complaining witness for me. Now, I know everyone has their different kind of terminology how they use that, but asking questions. If you see Eric Davis's name as a complaining witness, it's very guilt-assuming to say, how do you know Eric Davis, right? You want to think about how you may ask that question. Right? You want to think about, look, the report lists someone named Eric Davis as the complaining witness. Does that name mean anything to you? Does that name have any relevance to you? Do you even know who this person is? 
right? Because some clients may contend that they were arrested just walking on the street. They don't know why they're arrested. Some, that may be their story. You never know what position they're in. So you want to be very, very intentional about how you ask questions. What will witnesses say about this person? Right? And then from there, you're getting quality information from that client. Because if they do know who this person is, you start to find out the relationship. Maybe how to find them. Right? Uh, maybe other things about this person that is crucial for your investigation or mitigation. Right? So you want to think about those things. What will witnesses say versus how do you know? Right? Consider how to relay information that does not suggest guilt. Meant to, me, meant to say does not suggest guilt. So one thing I want to I want to show a brief clip, but it centers around, and I, I couldn't be on the campus of such a powerful man, and such a, a great uh, inspiration to our practice today, Mr. Thurgood, Justice Thurgood Marshall. Uh, you know, for many of you know, he was a, he was a brilliant attorney for the NAACP. Uh, he. Um, the first African-American Supreme Court justice, right? And he argued the Brown versus Board of Education, right? That argued that the schools, right, segregation of public schools was unconstitutional. Well, well if many of you not, may not be aware, but there was a movie made about him uh, titled appropriately Thurgood Marshall. I want to show you a brief clip of a, movie, of, of, of a part of this movie, and I want you to think whether, whether any stereotypes that apply or not. You may not be able to hear it, I just want to make sure. speaker is either. It is. Technical difficulties, folks. Okay, what I'll try to do is explain, explain it. I had a feeling, you know, I was told that this could be a challenge. So, um, I was prepared to explain it. Uh, what's happening here is that uh, some of you may even be familiar with the scene. He goes into the jail. He's meeting this guy that's accused of rape. He's meeting this guy for the first time, and then he first asks him, did you rape this woman? First thing, right? That doesn't even ask the guy's name. And he says, um, we're, we're part of the NAACP. We only represent people accused of their crime. And so at this point, we need to know if you're innocent. You know, so when I ask you, look at me, did you rape that woman? And he says, I never touched that woman. And he says, congratulations, you have lawyers now. He reaches out to shake his hand. Now, I'm not suggesting there's no point in showing the rest of it. You'll see exactly what I just said. Um, I'm not suggesting the purpose of this clip was to think about how TV is portraying one of our inspired leaders. A law school was named after this man. And think about some of those stereotypes, right? Of those are the first questions you're asking, right? In that role, he could be, he's dangerous in acknowledging a stereotype, right? Where a client may have to prove their innocence to you, the advocate, right? And so, I'm not suggesting that this is verified. I don't know if this is verifiable. I mean, other than him being in the NAACP and some of the, some of the things that I posted up, I'm not suggesting that the great Thurgood Marshall uh, conducted client interviews like that. But just the portrayal of that, even from somebody that we're portraying as a great leader, right, could still be, have negative implications on stereotypes, right? So it's just to be cautious of that and be cautious of anything that we're doing, because a lot of us see the cleans like, oh, thank you, Marshall, great, yeah, he's coming in here, he's doing this, right? And listening how that, how that happens. Now, one thing I want to tell you later on in this movie, for those of you that may know the movie, he says he never touched that woman, he never did anything, but then it comes back that this was in the 40s, right? This is before he became Supreme Court Justice, and in the, in the movie it turns out that he actually did have sex with her, but it was consent, and this woman was trying to cover it up because she was white, right? And not only did she have an affair, but she had an affair with a black man, right? And, to, and this man sitting in this position, talking to another black attorney of the NAACP, still didn't get that information out of him. I'm using that because the next example that I want to talk about is coming up. But the first thing you want to think about is advocating, not assessing, knowing your role. Knowing your role as the advocate, right? Your goal is to reach a desired outcome. 
as a defense attorney. It's not to determine innocence or guilt or form your own opinion about it. Now, I know sometimes we have the own habits of talking inside to another colleague or to another person we trust, and we form our opinions about it. But in the moment with your client, right? I mean, some of it's human nature. I get it, right? But it's also remembering your role with that client. So don't just tell client. Show them. Show them. Don't convey your personal, don't be judgmental and convey a personal belief about what you believe. This is not the atmosphere for what you believe. Many of us think about this in the context of our daily lives. We feel offended if somebody in the workplace or just at a Starbucks coffee shop comes and starts talking to you about what they believe or what they don't believe and forcing it on you. Then how are we to treat our clients any less? So you want to think about this even in that client relationship. See, unlike your friendships, unlike your you know, relationships that you develop, this is a relationship where you can't repeat anything with your client. As a, well, unless, you know, spousal privilege, of course. But nonetheless, outside of that, right, it's a very special relationship. You want to think about that every single day that you're representing that person. So scenario two, and this is leading up to what the last example that I was talking about. Lawyer is in an initial meeting with client. Lawyer initial meeting is a thing to point out. Lawyer says to the client, okay, the allegation that you walked up to a woman on the street and began to beat her about the face with, without provocation. The woman says she does not know you and has no idea why you did this. The lawyer then says, okay, now tell me what happened. And the client immediately reacts by saying he was not there, whoever the woman is, uh, she is lying, and that he was at home at the time that this happened. So. Again, thinking of these stereotypes, this is a highly, I'm going to warn you, this is a highly debatable topic. I don't care how like-minded you are in this room, but about asking the what happened question, right? And I'm talking about in the context of the initial meeting, right? Because I'm certainly I'm not trying to suggest asking that question means a good suggestion, a good result for your client, or not asking it means it. It's just being aware of the dangers of asking that from an initial setting of what can happen. Think about in the context of the Third Good Marshall movie, right? The problems that can happen with this is it forces a client to commit without establishing a relationship, right? This client doesn't trust you yet, or may not trust you yet. Regardless of your reputation, regardless of your website, regardless of how you know them on the courtroom, they may not know any of this, and nor do they care, oftentimes or not. They want to get out, and they want to get out of the situation. So that relationship, at the, lot, at the end of the day, is the most important thing you have. So you want to think about that, right? It's forcing them to commit without establishing a relationship. Again, back to the dating example. If you go on a date with someone, and then you meet them at this place, you've obviously, you obviously figured out that you're physically attracted to this person, to some degree, inter, you know, interactionally attracted to this person, are you going to go there and say, OK, now I want you to tell me all the reasons why you're going to marry me in the future, right? You're presuming that they're going to marry you, you just jumping the gun. You don't do that in our day-to-day -day life, right? So think about in the context of this client that's just meeting you. And don't tell them what kind of trauma this client has been through before he even got to you, right? So you want to think about that. And then incentivize this client to paint a picture of innocence to you, right? Once they commit to that story, then they're going to expect every investigative, every investigative step you take to go towards that particular theory. Rather than starting a case and you have a sea of theories out there and you're investigating with a sea of theories out there, you're wetting everything on that. So when it comes up that a fingerprint uh, report comes up or a DNA report comes up, now you have a problem. Now you have a problem with that initial what happened question, right? That's some things that can go wrong. I'm not saying it always goes wrong that way, right? But so, these are just some considerations of how things could play out, right? Client becomes wed to a version, uh, wed to this version, regardless of new information, right? And then it can ruin a client relationship. If you had that relationship where you got this, what happened out there? The DNA report comes wrong. Now you're saying, okay, uh, well, we might not need to go with this. Now the client is start to think that you think they're guilty, and then now you've created another barrier, right? So these are some of the things that what happened early on could go wrong. Now, obviously, there are situations and circumstances where that may be necessary. I'm not suggesting, again, that 100% of this is supposed to be it. But it's just a consideration of how dangerous that question could be at an initial client meeting. Eventually, obviously, you're going to get there. You're going to get there, and it's going to be important. But you just want to consider that at the beginning of asking them what happened. So because the goal is to develop a relationship that Client doesn't feel wed to anything that he tells you, right? Understand the focus on what the government alleges, right? On what the government alleges. They're bringing the indictment. They're bringing the charges. They're trying to convict, right? And the client to understand why it's important for you to help him determine the evidence against him. So it all centers back on that attorney-client privilege. 
It's not just about you know, attorney-client privilege where everything you and I say, I can't repeat unless you give me permission. Or when you're talking about confidentiality, everything related to the representation, right? You're also telling them like, look, I understand that you may not know me. You may not feel comfortable talking to me. I understand that. So there may be a reason why you don't feel like you need to trust me with information now. I get that. I understand that your memory may be one way today and another day tomorrow. I understand that. I just want to know that attorney-client privilege, I want you to know that it maintain, you maintain that flexibility with me. Right? Letting that client, setting the atmosphere for them to trust you and to give you quality information that will help your representation and help them going forward and your investigation. So you want to consider those things. The plea discussion. Um, we talked about that being stereotypes. Um, the best way, I think, to handle that is to handle it early. To handle it early. Prepare them for it, right? Ask them, you may, it may go like this, you know, do you know what a plea agreement is? Look, I consider myself a trial lawyer. I consider myself fighting for you. But undoubtedly, throughout this case, there's going to be a plea. The DA, the state, the prosecutor, whatever you want to call them, may come to me with a plea. Not necessarily because I asked for it, but because they, value, they evaluated their case and they decided that this is something they want to argue. I want you to know that, you know, we'll discuss it, but you maintain that power, right, to accept it, reject it, and if you don't, then we'll go back forward and fighting for this case. I just want to prepare you for that because this happens in a lot of cases. And I want you to know that regardless of this happening, I'm still fighting for you regardless, right? You want to prepare clients for it. Let them know it's coming, rather than just hit them with, okay, uh, they've offered us 10 years TDC. Let them know it's coming, right? Let them know it's going to happen one day. Let them know that the fact of discussion says nothing about your view of the plea. And let them know the decision is theirs, and only theirs. Show clients that you, can ser you care about them as a person. Get to know them. Get to know them. Obviously, you're not going to be able to get to do that in an initial meeting, but throughout your representation, get to know them. Ask them things about them. Their family. If they said their mom is sick, right? When you go back in that next visit, if you're taking notes, I know sometimes it's hard to remember, take a note. So you know on September 27th, that's what, that's what happened. You're asking about them. Say, hey, I know your mom was sick, so what, what happened? You know, is her health improved? Little things like that. It only takes, I know sometimes it's time consuming, but that only takes a minute, if a minute, right? Get to know these things, know their interests, right? Obviously, these are their interests, right? LSU, in, in the sense, these are their interests. If they're not, I don't know who they are, right? So you want to think about these kinds of things. That was for you, Jackie. Uh, be yourself. <laughs> be yourself. And by being yourself, I like this quote by Lil Wayne. Some of you may not like him, may not even know him, but never apologize for what you feel. It's only like being sorry for being real. And the point of that is don't try to talk like a lawyer, right? Maybe you have a good suppression issue and you're saying, look, there was no reasonable suspicion to stop this client, and more or less, I think you have a good suppression of evidence issue. Not only that, when you got out of the car, they noticed a bulge, and guess what? I don't think they should have frisked you because there was no reasonable officer safety. You know, you're going on and on about that, and that sounds all good and great. But, you know, talk, talk how you would speak. Would you talk to your, your people like that that are not lawyers, right? Talk to them normal. Now, would you feel comfortable at least? And if you feel the need to emphasize what the legal connection to that is, by all means, do so. But speak to them like a human being. And by, by all means, we all have geographic differences. We all have racial differences. We all have differences in how we communicate. Don't try to speak like the client. Don't try to speak like anything you may assume is connected to the client. Speak like you, right? If you, who said that? Speak like you. And, and, and for my Louisiana people, give an example. You know, um, and, and I've seen scenarios where a lot of people may not be from Louisiana or New Orleans, and they'll come and they'll say things that just come off as, it's definitely gonna come off as authentic, and to some people it may come off as mockery. And so you want to be very, very careful about how you speak. Don't come in there saying, what's going on, baby? Let me talk to you. Don't come in there saying if that's not how you speak, if that's not what you do. And even in the context of how you speak, be aware of your surroundings, even if that is you. Okay? So my point is, you want to be mindful of those things. You're not impressing the client. In some ways, you're looking like a fool. You may think they're cool, but you may be entertainment whenever you walk away. So you want to be very confident. You want to be, make sure you know who you are. And, and, if, you, and if, you, if you feel like you're disconnected with a client, just be honest with them. Like, look, I'm not, and I have to tell you, I'm not from Houston. I'm not from Harris County. I don't know how things are going. I don't, I don't even know where the street is, OK? Even though I went to law school here, there's some things I just don't know. And so just be honest about what you don't know. It's OK. It's OK. 
be mindful of differences, right? And this is the we are the world kind, you know, y'all know that song, right? No? Okay, good, good. Be aware of gender differences, how you communicate, what somebody may prefer to be called. If they're a gender where you're wondering how should I address them, just ask, right? Race, right? Don't assume that every light-skinned person is not black. Don't assume that every, don't assume whatever the complexion of their skin is, whatever you purport it to be, right? Don't assume anything. You never know how people may take it. My mom is very, very fair-skinned, and she can't stand when somebody thinks she's not black, right? If somebody were talking to her as a client, you would have thrown out the whole relationship in the very beginning. So you want to consider these things because it does matter to clients. Class, education, sexual orientation, right? Religion, right? Don't, again, it kind of goes back to the whole belief thing. Now, I know sometimes we hear a lot of spiritual beliefs, but you want to be very, very intentional and cognizant about how you're relaying that and how you are receiving it as well. Uh, scenario three, and I'm going to read through a lot of these a little bit quicker for the sake of time. Uh, lawyers in the initial meeting with a client, lawyer hands the client a document, tells the client to read it. The client looks at the document and appears to be reading, then hands it back. The, the lawyer then begins to ask, the, uh, ask about the document. The client answers with very vague answers, appearing confused. Now, obviously, you can't give discovery here, so this may be a scenario where you're reading it out and you haven't observed their reaction. Right? You want to be mindful of these things, right? So you want to know, you want to see what stereotype you could be enforcing. Even though the client may not realize it, you may be enforcing that you don't care because you have to be sensitive to potential limitations, right? You want to be, sens you want to be sensitive and sometimes it requires observation, right? Is it okay if I read this to you, right? If there's something you don't understand, just let me know. Just let me know, right? Some things you may be playing a guessing game to see, but at least you're making efforts, right, to see if you can recognize those type of situations because they do happen. You want to be prepared for age differences. Maybe you have a very young client and you're older and they think that you don't understand what's going on now. Or maybe you have a young, client, a young lawyer and they're older and they think that you're not incompetent, right? You're not competent because you haven't been around in long enough or whatever the case may be. Be mindful of those things, right? Be mindful of those things. Emotional, physical abuse. Clients that may, some of you may be better trained in these type of scenarios. I'm not saying we're experts in that, but it's just being mindful of things that they're doing. Right? Noticing physical type behavior that they're doing, rocking back and forth, or if a certain name says something, they bust out in tears and they can't even continue the conversation. Recognizing that trauma, right? If your office is funded or if you have funding, you may consider bringing a social worker or you may consider someone that is working in your office that may have a better, uh, uh, better experience dealing with this type of situation, right? Um, this scenario, this is simply a scenario of uh, indicating not making promises that you can't keep. In this case, this is the context of a bond hearing, and I'm just kind of skipping along here. And they're asking, is it a good motion? The client says, so I can go home, right? You filed a bond reduction, uh, a bond reduction uh, motion. Client is asking, so I can go home. You're confident that you can, right? The lawyer says you have a good shot. Client keeps pressing the lawyer, and the lawyer finally says, yes, you can expect to go home. You always want to be mindful of that situation because you could be reinforcing one of these stereotypes again. Right? Um, so you never want to make promises you can't keep. Right? Maybe it's a great bond reduction hearing, or maybe you think that you've gotten some things out to get this, right? In a bond hearing context, or if you're readdressing bond hearing once it's been indicted, or before it's been indicted, once it's been moved out of PC court, you want to be very careful and mindful of that. So you want to stop short of guaranteeing, because there are some things outside of your control. We all know that. Right? So maybe you're telling the client, instead of saying, yeah, you're going to go home, I'm sure of it. You know, look, I'm as sure as I can be about this result, but there are some situations that's outside of my control. There are some situations that's outside of my control, so I want to stop short of giving you a guarantee, right? You want to make sure that if you guarantee something to that client, that you can do it. But there are some stuff that you can do, right? Making maybe returning phone calls, calling that person's mom, visiting the client, following up. There are some promises that you can make, or you have a better shot of living up to at the very least. Make sure you make those promises that you can, right? Because you'll always be this guy for my Game of Thrones fans. If you break a promise, that's how they're going to see you. That's how they're going to see you, right? But if you keep a promise, you're going to look like this guy. Even though the ending of Game of Thrones sucked, you still will look like this guy. Right? So you want to have, you want to be aware of how, you, how you're going to look to that client because that's going to carry on and build on. So some of the things, again, keeping the client updated 
with, uh, me, uh, with, the, with the practice, right? It proves that you're giving the case attention. Even if there is no progress, you can say, look, tell them the truth. There isn't been no progress. I'm still waiting on this video surveillance to come in. I'm still waiting on these body cameras, right? There, there's been a delay with body cameras. But here are some of the things. Always think of something you can do in the case. Look, I know that this is causing some delay, but here are some things I'm thinking about doing. Even if it's working for a motion, drafting a motion to suppress, I'm playing with this idea of a motion to suppress. I'm talking with some of my colleagues about it who are within my office, and I want to get some of their ideas. These are some of the things I will be doing, right? So you want to consider that, right? Because it keeps clients from turning elsewhere with advice. Because then they'll come with this 10-year-old uh, criminal code of procedure, and they'll tell you all these things based on the jailhouse lawyer who doesn't have a degree. They may have some knowledge, right? But they didn't necessarily go through the legal analysis of how things apply a lot of times. Some of the times I've seen where they, hey, they spot on. But there's some times where they're not. So you want to try to minimize that and keep them going to you as their primary source of information and legal trust. So those are the ways to do it, right? To consider keeping your client from turning elsewhere by keeping them updated on their case, right? That keeps them also fulfilling the need to test you. And it saves time in the long run. Uh, this scenario is brief. You know, you're in the context of a preliminary hearing, probable cause, whatever kind of hearing, right? The lawyer says he has no argument on probable cause. Or you say no argument, judge. Now, I know sometimes there, is no, there are no arguments to make, but just consider sometimes, especially if this is your first hearing with your client, what stereotype you could be reinforcing, right? Consider that. Show them that you're a fighter. Show them that you're a fighter. Even if what you're saying may not win, say it passionately. Think about how you're saying it. Think about how you're doing it, right? If I, just in the context of this, if I came along, some of you are sleepy no matter what I do or say. But if I came and I just read all of this stuff monotone, what is it going to do? It may be great information, but what does it matter? Right? So you want to consider that. Your clients feel no different in the context of court. So you want to take advantage of opportunities to argue and argue with conviction. Right? It may not be your life that depends upon it, but theirs do. And so does somebody connected to them. Right? Um, and this is one of, this is the last scenario, right? And some of us, this is very familiar because this happens in Louisiana and I've seen it happen here. Lawyer and client are seated in the courtroom before court begins, prosecutor walks in, lawyer stands up and says, hi to prosecutor, hey Jim, good seeing you, how's your family, let's put on meeting for golf soon, lawyer and prosecutor exchange pleasure reasons, then sits down. Think about that. Now I know some of you are saying, what am I supposed to say? Walk in and say, screw you, you're, you're, you know, you're, <laughs> I'm not saying that, right? I'm not saying that. But two ways to handle that. I would suggest is being mind, but first you got to be mindful of what your client is seeing. They see a bunch of people in suits. They can't distinguish you. I know sometimes we look at the little black laptops. We barely can distinguish people sometimes. So your client surely can't. Maybe consider having a conversation with them and saying, look, you're going to about to walk in here and you're going to see me speak to them, right? You're going to see me by them, the prosecutor, right? I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm doing. Now, just because I speak to them does not mean that I'm for them. It means that I'm getting information about your case. I'm learning things, some things that they're supposed to tell me, and maybe some things that they're not. So if you see doing that, don't get it twisted. I'm fighting for you. Or, or maybe you may have to tell the prosecutor. Take them outside. If they really cool with you like, you, like, like it, it is, you should be comfortable enough to say, look, in front of my client, hey, just, you know, just try to keep the pleasantries at a minimum. I'll say, hey, but, you know, I'm really concerned about how my client sees this. Right? Having a conversation with them. Tom? Well, that's it. Really being conscious of other people around you, right? And how, you're, and how your client may see that. So being that I'm running low on time, this is abbreviated client meetings, really just making sure they know when you only have seconds or minutes between the time, uh, being sure they know the important things and making sure the client focuses on that. If you're in the context of a PC hearing, you may be telling them, look, this is the purpose of the hearing, right? This is, and getting the information necessary. This may sound very mechanical. This may sound this way, but I'm getting this information because right now I want to focus. I know you got a lot of things you want to tell me. But I want to, I'm going to, and I'm going to follow up on that or send the next attorney who will be attorney to follow up on that. But right now, I want to focus on the information that gives you the best chance of getting out. Can we do that? Keep a hold on the thoughts you need to talk to me about, and we will get back to it, or someone will. Okay? But for now, let's talk about this. Right? So let them know, right? Let them know that you're interested about their concerns, and let you know that they have them. Right? Now, sometimes this last one, it really depends on if they're going to another attorney. So I know that that could be a little bit of a challenge. But these are some of the hurdles that we were talking about overcoming that we've talked about. I know I had to speed through some of these for the sake of time, but it's just some considerations on that. Because if you consider some of these hurdles and overcoming these hurdles, it makes it easier to obtain relationship and still client confidence and minimizes clients' constant need for reassurance. Right? 
So just consider these things and also transfer negative images of who we are, not just public defender, but anybody in a defense bar. Um, I know that since we're losing time, I want to put my email address up. If you have questions, concerns, uh, comments, whatever the case may be, uh, feel free to send my email address. I'll be happy to answer them. I'm happy to be invited here. Thank you for all for having me. Sorry, I'm just so if y'all have any questions, Kenneth will step outside and answer any questions for you. Or you can email him, of course. I'm so sorry. No, 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 I told you, take as much time as you want. I'll just put this so, in the cycle here. Our next speaker is Mark Bennett. And my initial impression of Mark Bennett was not the most favorable one. <laughs> Um, because I, I saw him on the listserv and uh, you know he, he sort of picked on people a little bit and then I met Mark Bennett in person and I realized that his computer persona was very different from the real man and the real man loves people he cares about people he will put his phone down in order to make eye contact with you and have a real conversation he gives some of the best hugs in all of Harris County if you think that Mark Bennett is an asshole you may not be completely off but you may not have the full story it's fair. <laughs> I told him to give me a bio and he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> He's been practicing for over 24 years. He's a graduate of the Trial Lawyers College. He has a unique perspective on the practice of law, which includes doing some creative things like improvisation, psychodrama. Um, he Hypnosis. Hypno yeah, well, I was going to leave that out because it's just too far out the box, but okay. All right. Hypnosis. Um, he thinks outside the box. He has also been successful in getting part of the online solicitation statute uh, ruled unconstitutional, which I'm quite grateful for, and I'm hopeful he may help me get something else ruled unconstitutional at some point. So he's very approachable. If you have questions or need anything, please, y'all, bug this man. He is brilliant. Thank you. So I want to talk about Kenneth. How many of you knew Kenneth before this morning? He said five to 10%, I'd say you know, 15% maybe. How many of you trust Kenneth after his talk? <laughs> right? How many of you think that Kenneth is a warm human being after his talk? How many of you think that Kenneth is a competent human being after his talk? And how many of you think that he is beneficent, that he cares about you, that he has your best interests at heart after his talk? Right? That's a great vor dire. That's the impression that you want to leave a jury with at the end of your time in vor dire. How did Kenneth get there? What did you notice about how Kenneth talked? What did you notice about his tone of voice? Oh, wow. He spoke loudly, his tone changed, his speed changed, he was animated, he gestured, he motioned. And he didn't hide behind the podium. He didn't hide behind the podium, right? In fact, he pointed that out. I don't like to be behind the, the podium, I like to move around, right? All of this stuff and everything in his presentation, in fact, is how to do a good vor dire. I could have taken his presentation and said, look, these things that he, that he talks about communicating with clients, that's how you communicate with potential jurors, right? You be yourself. You talk like a human being. You don't talk like a lawyer. You explain things in clear terms. You give them the benefit of the doubt. All of this is vor dire. <coughs> so that was an excellent introduction to my topic, and I don't have anything more to say. That's all. Just, just take all that. So, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You people know I love to hear myself talk. 18 simple rules for better jury selection. I wanted to give you something here today that will be actionable for you on Monday. Something that if you just remember one of these rules and if it's something new to you, it's going to make you better at picking a jury on Monday. 
So I've come up with these simple rules. And jury selection is probably the most complex part of trial, right? Because you're talking to 60 or 25 or 100 different people, right? So you've got all of these personalities. And in addition to that, you have all of the other things that are going on at every moment in trial. Right, you have the judge who's, who's scowling at you and you have the prosecutor who's looking for an opportunity to make an objection. And so you have all of this pressure on you while you're trying to make a human connection with 60 different strangers, right? So it's a very complex process, just like that's a very complex image. Do you all know what that is? Fractal. It's a Mandelbrot fractal, right? And the more you zoom in on it, which is what the video is doing, you see that it looks really complicated, but it just repeats and it repeats and it repeats at different levels. So with a few simple mathematical rules, you can generate a, Ma a Mandelbrot fraction. Simple rules doesn't mean that the process is simple. Simple rules means that you have a way of handling the process that your brain can handle, even though it's a very complex process. There's a law of requisite variety, and this comes from a science called cybernetics. You all have heard of, oh, cybernetic organisms, cyborgs, right? Well, cybernetics is the interaction of humans and machines. And the, the, the law of requisite variety says that you've got to have more ways of dealing with the situation than there are outcomes of the situation or there are states or conditions that the, that the situation can be in. So if there's a system, let's say system is a light switch, right? So a light switch, to flip the light switch on and off, you have to be able to do at least two things, right? You have to be able to flip up and flip down. But then you're no more complicated than the light switch. And it's a very simple uh, system, and all you need is two states. I can move my finger up and move it down. Except that's not true, because what happens when you're not moving your finger up or down? You're staying still, right? So you've got three states to deal with that light switch. It's a system. It's got two different states. You have to have three, switch, three states to deal with it, three conditions. So that's the law of requisite variety. And, and in your life, you can look at it and say, OK, you know, what can I do? What talents do I have? What skills do I have? What, what, uh, how do I respond to situations in my world? And you can look at it and you can say, wow, you know, when I have more than one way to deal with a situation, I do better than if I only have one way to deal with it, right? Because if you only have one way to deal with something, if you have, say, a script that you have to follow, then when the, when the situation goes off the script, you're lost, right? And not just in Vordire, but in dealing with, with your family, in dealing with, with your clients, right? That was one of the things that Kenneth said, is don't have a script. Because if you have a script when you're dealing with your client, the client doesn't have the script. And when you give your first line, the client's response is not going to be what you expect it to be in the script, and so suddenly you're off the script. So the law of requisite variety is we've got to have more ways to deal with situations than there are situations. Rule zero, jury selection. Uh, when Jackie and Kenneth were talking about voir dire, voir dire, who said I call it jury selection? Jury you call it jury picking, right? But it's not. It's not, I mean, yeah, that's what we call it. We call it jury pick and we call it jury selection, but it's not the most important thing about what we do in jury selection. It's one of the things that we have to do is we have to figure out who we're going to use our peremptories on and how we're going to use uh, challenges for cause to eliminate the people who are less favorable to us. And so we have to figure out who the people less favorable to us are. But we do that by getting them to tell the truth. Right? Because the people who are less favorable to us, we want them to tell the truth and say, yeah, you know, I really hate your client and I'm not going to be able to, to put that out of, out of my mind and it's going to prejudice me in this case and I can't follow the law. And boom, they're gone. Right? We want them to tell that truth. And if the truth is just a third of that, then we want to help them get up to the point where they confess that cause applies. Right? Um, you know, there's a, there's got, there's, there are lots of cases down at this courthouse, and you know, if you called me in on a, an abuse of an animal case, I'd be the wrong juror for that case, because I just can't be objective. And it sounds to me, Mr. Jones, like this might be that kind of case for you, right? Yeah, it is. OK. So yes, we have to select the jury, but we have to get them to tell the truth. And how do you say to tell the truth in old law French? Voir dire, right? So it's voir dire or voir dire. What is jury selection about? It's about winning your case. Uh, 
it may not be all that matters. Something might happen later in the trial that affects the outcome after Vordaer. But you have to treat it as though it's all that matters. You can't go into Vordaer with the attitude, okay, you know, I'm going to do a Vordaer here, but I'll win the case later on. Because if you don't win the case in Vordaer, you're probably not going to win the case. And I can talk at length about the theory of that, about how, how our brains work, and these cognitive biases that make us reach a decision emotionally, and then follow that decision with the facts, or, or pay attention to the facts that support that emotional decision. But for right now, just, just trust me. Treat jury selection as though it is all that matters. And of course, an opening statement. You can treat opening statement as though it is all that matters. And of course, when you're cross-examining the government's witnesses, you treat the cross-examination as though it is all that matters. But for today, for right now, jury selection is all that matters. So you want to build your credibility and you want to build your likability. Kenneth, credible, right? Yes. yes. Likeable, yes. yes. Right. You want to demolish the prosecutor's credibility if you're given the opportunity to do it. We have this, hey, there, there the man is, hey. Yeah, credible and likable, well done, yeah. <laughs> So I, I used you as an ex your talk as an example of a good Vordire, right? And you probably do Vordire the same way. I try to. You try to do Vordire the same way. Yeah. So demolish the prosecutor's credibility. So when you go into Vordire and the jury sees the people there sitting at the tables, who has the most credibility? Well, in the room, there's the judge, right? So the judge probably has the most credibility. And then the prosecutor has this built-in credibility because people want to believe that their government has their best interests at heart. So they find out that this guy or this lady is a prosecutor, and they think, okay, well, I can believe that person. It's an innate disadvantage to us. And we have to, if given the chance, we have to demolish that disadvantage. And then we do that by demolishing the prosecutor's credibility. Finally, we want to build a group in Vordire. That is, we want the jury of six or 12 people to be six sevenths or 12 thirteenths of the group that's going to decide the case. And who's the other person in the group? You are. The lawyer is. No, not the foreman. The foreman's one of the six or 12. The lawyer is the last person in that group. You want to make a connection with them so that they see how similar you are to them and how similar their goals are to yours. Oh, no, finally, 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 just kidding with the last finally, you want to get the jury to find your defense. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is you have a defense. I hope you have a defense. You might not have a defense. You might just be trying it for the sake of trying it, and that's a, a, a good and honorable thing to do as well. But assuming that you have a defense, you want the jury to tell you in voir dire, this is what your defense could be. If your defense is, um, she was having an affair with him, and his wife found out because she saw the bank account where he was transferring the money to her, and so he made up the story about her having the, the uh, about her stealing from him, because actually they were having an affair, and she was trying to, he was trying to conceal it from the wife, which is a case that I tried. Right? We have a bizarre set of facts. Mark, where'd this come from? I actually tried this case. And I didn't tell the jury that this was, was the theory, but my client was an attractive looking middle aged blonde lady. And the jury's mind wandered off that way when I talked about the, the, the undeniable fact that she had taken money from the guy and that he claimed that it was theft. Well, how could that happen? And one of the jurors came up with this idea. I didn't have to say it. I may have, you know, I gave them enough of a hypothetical that, that, you know, given that hypothetical, a smart jury is going to find it. But they came up with my defense. And then, of course, in an opening statement, I said, you guys were right. You guys figured it out. That's what happened. <laughs> so how do juries decide cases? Are they rational decision machines? No, they're not. Uh, when do they make up their minds? The way that all of us make up our minds about things, which is very early on. How do they make up their minds? They make them up emotionally. They make up their minds by the end of opening statements. In fact, there are things that can change their decision after opening statement. I call it blockbuster evidence. Blockbuster evidence is something that comes in that they didn't hear about in voir dire or in opening statement that they can't ignore and that changes their view of the case. So what do we have to do? Well, in voir dire and opening statement, we have to make sure that they consider everything that we think is likely to come in. Because if something comes, if there's a confession, for example, um, and it comes in and we haven't prepared them for it in these first minutes of the trial, then it's going to hurt our case because it, it will potentially change 
people who were our jurors from the beginning into the state's jurors. The other thing that can change jurors' minds is a shift in credibility. If, something, if we do something to lose credibility, then jurors, we can lose jurors who at the end of opening statement were our jurors. They wanted to vote. So when I'm talking about our jurors, what I mean is at the end of opening statement, they want to vote for us. Their gut says the defense is right here. And so throughout the trial, they're going through this cognitive bias process of absorbing all of the evidence and filtering out the stuff that says they're wrong and accentuating the stuff that says they're right. And then at the end of the trial, in the jury room, what happens is you've got maybe nine people who believe one way and three people who believe the other. And chances are, and there's, there's sociological and psychological research to back this up, that the, peop that the majority is going to win. The majority is going to shift everybody else over their way. So back in the jury room, you want your jurors to have the ammunition to say, okay, there's this evidence and that's evidence of innocence and there's that evidence and that's evidence that the prosecution's uh, witnesses are liars. Uh, but realistically, jurors are not doing what we pretend that they do, which is this rational consideration of all of the evidence and decision based on that rational consideration. What they're doing is they're going back in the jury room and it's like a, a rugby scrum where they're pushing at both sides and you know whoever has the most people on their side when, when uh, deliberation begins is probably going to win that fight. Uh, what will change their minds after that? Blockbuster evidence. So here's how people think. Person has a belief. There's a, a, a thousand pieces of evidence proving that they're wrong. There's one person who agrees with them. Well, they're going to side with the person who agrees with them. And this is just the way that people think. And this is counterintuitive to lawyers because the jury instructions presume otherwise. We pretend, we've learned in law school to pretend that jurors are these rational decision-making machines. They are not because they're human beings. And we have to recognize that. We have to recognize that in ourselves that we make our decisions based on our gut and then we follow them with our brains. And we have to recognize that juries do that as well, that, that the vast majority of jurors, and you know, there are some who, who yeah, perhaps on the autism spectrum, who uh, don't make their decisions that way, who really do cold-bloodedly analyze all of the facts before making a decision, but the vast majority of human beings make their decision based on their gut and then follow it with their brain. Uh, so you want as many people on your side as you can when the case begins. Uh, you want them to find your defense in jury selection. Why do you want them to find it? Because if they find it, they believe it. If you tell them what it is, well, that's just a lawyer telling them something. You may have a lot of credibility. It may be better than nothing, but it, it's much stronger if they find it. And if it's a good defense, they'll find it. Right? If, and you may have, again, you may have no good defense. That's a different situation. I'm talking about the case where you have a good defense. If they don't find it, your defense sucks, and that's fine. Uh, what about the rest of the trial? The rest of the trial matters too, of course. So rule number one is the Nike rule. The Nike rule is just do it. Do jury selection. Do it yourself. Don't have somebody else come in and do your jury selection for you, which I know of lawyers who have done. Practice jury selection. How do you practice jury selection? Talk to strangers. You talk to strangers, right? There are no strangers, right? So you're at the grocery store and there's somebody in line behind you and you start up a conversation with the person behind you. It doesn't even have to be any, about anything important, but the best practice for jury selection is talking to strangers, because what is jury selection? <laughs> it's talking to strangers. Um, the third of the three ways to just do it. So that's two ways to just do it. One is pick your juries. The second is, is uh, I, don't, I don't remember. Those are the two important ways. Talk to strangers and pick your juries. Rule two is the blind date rule. Treat jury selection like a blind date with 60 people, right? So you know, there's one second before the, the blind date and, and he's got his image of her and she's got his image of him and they're about to find out that Neither of them are, are, neither of those images is correct. And if they're. Back to this cartoon personification of Floyd and Dr. Lamar. Okay. Well, thank you. Well uh, noted. <laughs> Do you have any other comments? <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> personification of women? Really? You object to the personification of women? Wally. Would you rather they be objectified, Jackie? Wally and Keith. Women think about men in other ways. Okay. 
<laughs> picture, picture is a uh, picture an eggplant in the thought bubble there. <laughs> Mark, <laughs> sir. Don't use that in your What's that? Don't use that in your board. I, you know, I might just to get them talking because yeah, you know, we have, people are going to find people are going to find it objectionable. Um, so, but the point is, it's, it's a blind date. You're going in and there are these people and what do you want to do in a blind date, right? You want the other person to like you, right? You want to find out something about the other person to see if you, see if, uh, if you like them. So treat jury selection like you would hypothetically treat that, that, that you have this, these people and you want to find out something about them. You don't want to be highly offensive, but you want to give them enough information about yourself that they re uh, reveal information about themselves and you know communally whether you want to spend time together. Of course, they, I was going to say they don't have peremptory challenges that they can use against you, but in fact they do, don't they? A juror can decide, I don't want to be on this jury, and what can the juror do? I mean, jurors know by the end of Vore Dyer, here's how I get off this jury, right? Okay, rule three is the Shrek rule. I wish we had audio. So the princess is making, uh, is making breakfast, and, and she feeds uh, breakfast to Donkey and Shrek, and they enjoy their breakfast. And then a little bit later, they're, they're, they're walking in the woods. They're walking in the woods. And Shrek lets out this enormous burp. And Donkey says, Shrek! And Shrek says, what? Better out than in. And then the princess burps as well, and they're, they're very impressed. So the Shrek rule is that. It's better out than in. It's better that we hear from the jur jurors their, their bad news, right, than that they keep it inside. Because guess what? If we don't hear it in Vordire, it's still there, right? They're just taking it back into the jury room with them. And if we don't hear about it, we can't deal with it. That's the Shrek rule. The Shrek rule is better out than in. It's turn over those rocks to see what's underneath. Because if you don't do it, there's still stuff underneath the rocks. It's the hair in the soup. My dad always used to say, we'd go out to eat somewhere and he'd find a hair in the soup. Somebody at the table would. And he'd say, well, that's great. Why is it great to find the hair in the soup? No? Free meal. No? No? It's great because the hair was there whether you found it or not. If you didn't find it, you ate it. <laughs> Better out than in, right? Okay, rule four is the 90-10 rule. Don't lecture. I can tell a good jury selection by standing outside the room. I don't know who the lawyers are. I don't know anything about the facts. I can just hear the voices like the voice, the, the parental voices in Charlie Brown in the peanuts, right? The trombone sound, the muted trombone. I can tell a good Vordire because the jury is doing 90% of the talking and the lawyer is doing 10%. I can tell a bad Vordire because the lawyer is doing 90% of the talking. In Vordire, you're not going to change people's minds. You are not going to change what they believe about DWI or about aggravated sexual assault of a child or about criminal trespass or anything else. You need to hear what they already believe about those things because you're not going to change their minds. And the corollary of that is they're not going to change each other's minds either. So if you have somebody who's just, just dead set against uh, a fair trial for somebody who's charged with a sex offense against a child, right? Welcome that. Because if they've told you that, first of all, you're, you're well on your way to a challenge for cause. But second, they're not going to convince the people, the rest of the, the jury, to take the same position. In fact, you can play it off of them. You know, Ms. Jones says that we shouldn't give a trial to somebody who's charged with aggravated sex, sexual assault of a child. Mr. Brown, how do you feel about that? How about you, Ms. Green? How do you feel about it? Right? And you're going to get people, you're, you're going to draw out more people who feel sort of the same things, which is, well, there are some crimes that are so bad that the Constitution shouldn't apply. But you're also going to start building your team of people who, your group of people who will support the Constitution, even though it's a horrible allegation. The McCarthy's bar rule, taken from Terry McCarthy, talk like a human being. Be yourself. 
don't talk like a lawyer. It's McCarthy's bar because uh, Terry McCarthy says, talk in the courtroom like you would talk in a bar room. But a nice bar, not one of these places you have down here with the sawdust on the floor. Terry McCarthy of Chicago. Talk in the courtroom like you would talk in a bar room. That is the, the rustic pine in, uh, in Dubois, Wyoming, home of the Trial Lawyers College. Rule six, improv one, improv rule one. The script is an impediment, right? And I talked about this. The, the potential jurors are not on your script. You, if you have a script, they're going off of it after the first question. And then what do you do with it? It's better not to have a script at all, not to depend on it at all. Do you agree? That if you have a script and they're going to go off the script, you'd be better off not having the script in the first place. The script is an impediment. Now, what else is a script? PowerPoint. PowerPoint is also a script, right? Because it's sequential, it's linear. You go from slide one to slide two to slide three to slide four. And it may be more manageable than, than an in-depth script. It's good to have different topics to talk about, but with a PowerPoint, you still have your script. And this reminds me of another reason that we shouldn't have a script is because what happens when you can't find your script right before trial begins. You start to panic, right? Well, where's my script? I need my script, I need my script. PowerPoint, the same thing. We had this experience this afternoon where my USB drive wouldn't go into the computer, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't open up on the computer. And so we couldn't open my PowerPoint. And I'm like, that's, that's cool. I will spend 45 minutes talking about why you shouldn't rely on PowerPoint and Vordire. Um, it wound up working, but that's another problem with a script, is there, that's something that is prone to failure. Much more prone to failure than just having an idea of how to talk to the human beings and having some topics that you want to talk about. Now, I, so, so I say no PowerPoint in Vordire. And there are a lot of people, I'm sure in this room, who disagree with me, who say you absolutely have to use PowerPoint in Vordire. Why do you absolutely have to use PowerPoint in Vordire? There's the state, the state the state using it. Uh, you don't have to do what the state does. That's Screw the state. No. So the argument is this. The argument is, and, and I, I honor the argument, the argument is that people nowadays are so accustomed to getting their information from screens that that's how we should be giving them information. Here's the problem with that theory. The people who are giving them information successfully, giving people information on screens, have degrees in psychology and in creative writing and in presenting information to people in a persuasive way on a screen. Most of us don't have that. We're trying to copy what we've seen done in, say, advertising or marketing or even a, a, a TV show, the news, where there, there is a scientific basis for everything that is being done to us when we look at a screen. We don't have that scientific basis. You and I don't have the power of, and the time, to make a PowerPoint presentation that ticks all of those persuasive boxes of hijacking the viewer's brains, which, let's be honest, that's what TV does. Here's my counter argument to the people are used to watching TV argument. People are used to watching TV. People are so used to watching TV that they're not used to doing this. Right? They're not used to having this happen to them. Right? Right. They're not used to human contact, eye contact, somebody looking at them and seeing that they're nodding along before moving along to somebody else and making sure that that person gets a part of the, the message as well. People, and, and that's magic. We've been doing it for, as human beings, for 150,000 years. We've been telling stories around fires. And I contend that despite all of the psychology, all of our brain hijacking that they're trying to do to us with video and with audio and with the internet, that that is the most powerful force in human communication, is that that eye to eye, face to face, I'm gonna keep talking to you until I make sure that you understand this concept before I move on to somebody else, right? <laughs> yes, exactly, thank you. Uh, rule, uh, improv rule two, I don't know why this is blank. Uh, don't block. You get a juror who tells you something. The improv, uh, do any of you do improv? So the, th 
There we go, Victoria. The, the big rule of improv, the, the, the first thing that you learn is called yes and. Anything that your improv partner tells you, you accept. You may not accept it as true, but you accept it as their truth, right? That, that you know, so for example, uh, I get on the stand with Victoria and uh, I say, boy, it's a lovely evening tonight. And Victoria says, it sure is. I'm glad we moved to the moon. Okay, so she has accepted that it's evening and it's a lovely evening. We've moved to the moon. That's awesome. And I'm glad we brought the cows with us, I might say, because it's so much easier to milk them up here. Right? And so now we've got an improv scene where, where, where I have just said it's a beautiful evening. She has established that we're on the moon. I accept that and I turn us into moon dairy farmers. And there's something maybe fun there, right? There, maybe there's something true. Maybe we discover some, some underlying truth of the human condition that we wouldn't have discovered if, if I had said it's a beautiful evening and she had said, no, it's not. Or she had said, I'm glad we moved to the moon. And I said, this isn't the moon. This is your backyard. Don't be crazy, Sophia, right? Uh, so that is improv rule number two. And you can do that with your jury as well. Everything that your jury says, don't say, no, that's wrong. You can't do that with these people. Because what they're saying is their truth. And so what you can do with your jurors is say, OK, you know, I, thank you for sharing that, right? Thank you for sharing that we're on the moon. Uh, who else feels that we're on the moon? And I'm just using we're on the moon metaphorically for something that a juror might say that, that is entirely outside of our usual frame of reference. But even that we can accept. Now there may come a point where somebody says something so crazy and you recognize that 59 of those jurors all see that number 60 is just a nut job. And then maybe you're released from having to, to pay attention uh, or having to accept what nobody else in the room is accepting. And we've all had this situation where a juror is just, just way off the reservation and you see that the rest of the panel is just not having any of their, of their nonsense. Uh, but barring that unusual situation, don't block. Rule eight is the shrink rule. How do you feel about that, right? The, the, your psychiatrist, psychologist doesn't ask you, well, what do you think about? Just your psychologist doesn't ask you yes or no questions. Um, you know, have you, have you, uh, did you have a difficult childhood, right? Your psychologist asks you, how do you feel? How do you feel? Because feeling triggers the stuff in here, right? Thinking we do up here, feeling we do down here. And that's what we want from the jurors. We want that especially from the jurors because that's not where the state operates. The state operates up here. The state is operating on, oh, okay, you know, I want you to be afraid. You need to be afraid of this person. I want people to feel what the whole, what, feel what everybody else is feeling. I want people to feel what I'm feeling. I will show my love for my client because I want the jury to feel that the way that I feel about my client is the way that they feel about some of the favorite people, their, their favorite people in their lives. Because if I have their credibility and my client has my love, my client has their vote. Rule nine is the beer pong rule. The ball is always in play. A topic comes up and juror number 17, Ms. Jones says, uh, um, well, I think that uh, everybody who is convicted of murder should be murdered, should be executed by the state, right? Well, you know, if, if it's a murder case, five to life, uh, you might not like that, but there's a ball and it just bounced at you. And what do you do with it? You bounce it back at somebody else or you bounce it back at Ms. Jones. Hey, okay, Ms. Jones, oh, I'd probably, that's a, that, in that hypothetical, it's a uh, uh, broad enough statement that I'd probably bounce it at somebody else. I'd say, you know, Ms. Brown, how do you feel about that? And get a response from her you know, and take what Ms. Jones has just said. Ms. Jones just said, and I have two choices here. One is I can use the exact words and the other is I can paraphrase. What do you think is better? So some people say paraphrase, some people say exact words, right? Exact words are better because you know that you're getting it right. Paraphrasing is better because they know that you've heard them. Because if somebody says something to you and you can paraphrase it back accurately, then they know that you've heard them, right? So if, if you say something to me and I paraphrase it back to you and say, is that right? You can say yes or you can say no. 
And if you say no, then I can work on getting the paraphrase right. But, but if, I, if you say something, and then I turn to Damon and says, she says, blah, 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 and I'm just a little bit wrong, that's a bad credibility hit, right? So if you're going to paraphrase, you'd better be darn sure you're going to get it right. And what's the only way to make sure you're going to get it right? Just to ask the person you're paraphrasing. Uh, rule 10 is the marathon rule. Save something for the end. Uh, I have some 24 by 36 posters of scaled questions. And sometimes at the end, I'll toss in a couple of those just to, to have some additional information from the jurors that I can then use in the close, close cases. You know, this person was a four on uh, people should be required to testify in their own trial, and this person was a five. Well, I'd rather have the, f all things considered, I'd rather have the four than the five. Uh, the playing doctor rule, show them yours, and they'll show you theirs, right? If you tell them uh, something about yourself, something that they're not expecting from a lawyer, uh, show some weakness. Because you have weakness, you go in there and you're scared, you'd better be scared. If you're not scared, then, then you, maybe you need to be doing something else. Because if you're not scared when you go in there to, to pick a jury, there's something wrong. It's a scary experience. You've got somebody whose life is in your hands, and you have no control over what the outcome is. And if you've been spending time with your client, your client's important to you. So confess your, your weakness. Uh, I might go in and say, um, you know, I'm, I'm nervous today and I've been doing this for 25 years and I still feel when I walk in and stand before you people like just melting out down into a puddle because I'm scared and I don't know uh, how I'm going to do this job for my client. And then I'll ask them, do, can you, anybody have, ever have any similar feelings? And maybe somebody will answer. But it'll, it'll get them to open up. If you share with them, they're more likely to share with you. As opposed to, and I think it's more obvious in contraposition to the usual lawyer thing, right? I'm a uh, you know, big, tough, smart lawyer. And, and uh, I'm going to be stereotypical smart lawyer here because you people are ex expecting me to be that way. Uh, do any of you have any problems with that? And, and uh, yes or no, can you give my client a fair trial? Uh, you're going to get much more information by sharing with them your vulnerability and allowing them to share with you theirs. Uh, if you want, uh, rule 12, the field tip trip rule, stay with the group, keep the group together. The group is your jury, uh, your jury panel, and you don't, you want to be following the conversation along with them and not trying to fight against them. And sometimes the conversation will occur, right, where you're just, you're out of control. And that's fine, just, just be along with it, you know. So if, if they're arguing amongst themselves and interesting things are happening, be there. Don't try to stop them and be the, the hall monitor. Rule 13, the undertow rule, never swim alone. There are young lawyers who want experience picking juries and they want to help you pick a jury. They want to be a pair of eyes. If there aren't young lawyers to do it, there are law students to do it. If there aren't law students to do it, there are college students or high school students or somebody from your office or your mom or your sister. But there's always somebody who, who is interested, who wants to learn about the process and wants to sit and help you pick your jury. Rule 14, the Atticus Finch rule, and this is just credibility. This is just being that, that believable guy. Because remember this scene from To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, stand up, your daddy's passing. Uh, everybody stands up for him. Why do they stand up for him? He just lost the case. Why do they stand up for him? They stand up for him because they respect him, they respect his credibility, and they respect his, what were the things I talked about with Kenneth, right? His warmth, he's a warm human being, right? He's competent, they respected his competence, and they respected his beneficence, that he had their best interests at heart. And that's why people love Atticus Finch, is not because he won the case, he lost the case, but they saw that he cared and that he did a good job for the client. It was just, there was nothing more that could be done. So be the lawyer they want to stand up for. And that's a, um, uh, that's a, uh, that's an ethos, right? Aristotle talked about ethos, pathos, and logos, which are the three components of rhetoric. Uh, ethos is 
being that that person is being the person who people want to follow. All right, pathos is creating the feeling in them that they want to follow, and logos is giving them the logic, the words that they want to follow. Rule 15 is the bat rule. Imagine audio of a bat chirping to get to uh, the, the the bat sonar chirping to get bugs. Right, that's. If the bat just chirped and chirped and chirped and never listened for the signal to come back, the bat would starve, right? Same with us. If we just talk and talk and talk and never let the signal come back from our jury, we'll starve. We won't get the information that they want to provide to us. And they do want to provide it to us. This is the other thing about this internet age where nobody's making eye contact. Nobody's listening, right? How many friends do you have on Facebook? 500, 1,000, I don't know. How many of them are actually listening to you when you say something, rather than clicking the like button? Never mind you, I'm sure you have an exemplary group of friends on Facebook, but look around at your friends and look at the, the, the vague, vapid connections that they're making with other people online. It's not sustaining, and it's not sustainable. So you have to listen. Be that person who they're, who's listening to them for the first time maybe in, in six months. Somebody's listening to what they have to say. Maybe in the first time in years, somebody's paying attention to them and, and looking them in the eye and, and seeming to be interested in what it is that they're thinking. Being genuinely interested, for that matter, in what they're thinking. The herd rule, people like to be part of a group. The one thing that I, that I hope you can take away from this rule is if you ask a question, do any of you X, do any of you think that, um, a pers that everybody who's convicted of murder should be executed? You're going to get fewer responses than if you ask the question in the form, how many of you think? Do any of you think implies that there might not be anybody, right? If I ask you, do any of you do this? All of you are thinking, well, I'm not going to be the first to raise my hand because he's saying that it might be possible that nobody thinks that. And I don't want to be the only one. I want to be part of the group. Whereas if I say, how many of us think that boom, 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 everybody's thinking, OK, well, this is an accepted position. And there are going to be others who raise their hand. So I'll go ahead and raise my hand. Even beyond, beyond thought, people are making this decision. Psychological studies show that people are more likely to volunteer information if they're asked the question in the form, how many of you, rather than in the form, do any of you? Rule 17, the good humor rule, do not take yourself seriously. Right? You don't want to make fun of the prosecutor. You don't want to make fun of the jurors. You don't want to make fun of the, the judge. But it's OK to make fun of yourself. People like it. When you make mistakes and then you are good humored about the mistakes, people love you. I don't know if, if any of you remember, um, I don't know, what's her name? Uh, the, the Alaska lady. Sarah, Sarah Palin on the late night show, <laughs> right? During the, in the run up to, to the election. Uh, she, uh, it may have been Letterman, and she's, she's just, she's got a sense of humor about herself, and, and people liked it. People like it when you have a sense of humor about yourself, as opposed to denying that being a prosecutor, denying that you make mistakes because you have this badge from the state of Texas which prevents you from being mistakes, from making mistakes. If you make mistakes and then you own up to them with a sense of humor and, and uh, you can laugh at yourself, then people love you. Rule 18, the short con, the long con. It's top secret. Any prosecutors in here? No. OK, cool. So, so a short con, long con. The short con is uh, I'm going to do something to take your money. OK? I'm not going to tell you that I'm doing something to take your money, but I'm, I'm going to con you out of your money. The long con is <laughs> here's your money back. You see how I just did that to, to take away your money? You, you can't, you don't need to be a victim of that, right? And the long con is, I'm going to take his trust in me for having revealed the short con, and I'm going to take much more money from him in the future. So with a jury, the short con is, oh, uh, what's a good example? So sometimes I like to start a jury selection like this. Like that, OK? What have I just done? Response. Hmm? Got a response. How? Uh, Non-verbally. Right? So, so I've shown non-verbal communication and I've gotten a response non-verbally. I might do it with more than one person. But then I'll reveal to the jury. I'll talk with the jury about what it is that I just did. 
That was the short con. I'm going to reveal to them the short con. Here's the reason that I just did that. I could even reveal to them the prosecutor's short con. Good morning. I said good morning, right? How many of you love that? How many of you think that makes the prosecutor likable? How many of you think that makes the prosecutor believable? You think that makes the prosecutor likable and believable? Huh, okay. So the rest of you who don't think that it makes the prosecutor likable and believable, how many of you like that? I like it. I like it because it's a prosecutor being a, 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 acting officious, acting, trying to put, put himself or herself into the position of a, the, the kindergarten teacher, which is what that is, right? You know, good morning, Ms. Jones. I, I didn't hear you say it again. Good morning, Ms. Jones. I, I have no objection to it, but I will point it out to the jury. What do you think she was doing, right? She was, she was trying to condition you. She was getting you to comply with her, right? She's not, she doesn't need you to say good morning. She's, it's afternoon, right? I mean, she doesn't care whether you say good morning. That's her little trick to start for dire so that you start talking, but you comply with her. She's teaching you compliance, right? So while I'm talking to you about her teaching compliance, what am I doing? I'm teaching you compliance because I'm going to say things and you're going to say yes, right? I'm going to make a statement or ask you a question and you're going to say yes. And when you say yes, you start getting into a compliant mode. This is hypnosis. Before you get people to start acting for you, doing physical things, you get them to start agreeing with you. Are you ready to be hypnotized today? It, does it sound like an interesting that would that would that would interest you, right? So, so two or three yes set questions, two or three compliance. Okay, I'd like for you to sit there, please, and and uncross your legs. Put your feet flat on the floor. Your hands on your on your thighs. You comfortable? No. Right. Okay. Well, make yourself comfortable. Are you comfortable now? Okay. So so com so I have gotten her to answer some questions. Yes, I've gotten her to do some physical things. It didn't work. The uncrossed legs were not comfortable. I have a piece of information that I didn't have before. But I asked her, and we returned to that position, and now she's comfortable. And you can be comfortable. Just yeah. the effect. Right. So, so Jackie says the hypnosis stuff is way out there. It's not really. It's communication. Hypnosis is just a pure form of communication. And if you learn it, you can see it everywhere and you can use it everywhere. Cross-examination. Yes, Mark. Yes, exactly. Right? So Terry, we talked about Terry McCarthy. Terry McCarthy gets the witness saying yes, 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 yes. Once you start saying yes, 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 guess what it's hard to say? No. no, right? So you get a juror, and, and Terry will get people, jurors to or get witnesses to admit to crazy things because they're in yes mode. So what do you do with your clients when you're dealing with their cross examination if they're going to testify? Here's what I do. I tell them, look, the prosecutor is trying to get you into this yes mode where you're saying yes, yes, yes. The answers to the questions are going to be yes. You're going to have to answer the questions yes, but before you do that, I want you to listen to the question, repeat it to yourself in your head, and then only if you're sure the answer is yes, answer the question, which breaks the, the spell of the yes mode because I've introduced this extra step where I'm requiring my clients to stop and repeat the question before answering so that even though the first 15 questions might be yes, the client is hopefully going to stop and think before the 16th question. Um, Oh, so I wish we had audio. This is a scene from a movie called House of Games. David Mamet, uh, M-A-M-E-T, is brilliant on uh, uh, con men, movies about con men. And then this one, uh, uh, Mantegna. Joe Mantegna is, is uh, I don't remember who the, well, I don't know the woman. He's, he's a con man, and he's showing her how the con game works which is like with Tom. I'm saying, look, you know, this is how you con, so this is how I would con somebody. He's not ultimately going to take the young soldier's money, but he's showing her how it's done so that she trusts him because, and I don't think this is going to be a spoiler because it's an old movie, but ultimately he's going to, to take a bunch of money from her using the long con because she trusts him because he revealed the short con. Uh, I don't know if these are, are good anymore. Uh, 
my blog, benandbennett.com.blog or defendingpeople.com. Harry Plotkin's jury tips, if you haven't subscribed to them, subscribe to them. He's, he's directed mostly at civil lawyers, but it's brilliant stuff for picking, and, uh, picking juries and trying cases. Uh, if you need to email me, it's mb at ivi3.com. That's India, Victor India, numeral 3.com. Jackie has given away my secret, which is that I am very generous with my time. I will, however, ask you what you've done to answer your question before I answer your question, because I don't want people to make me <laughs> the first um, place where they go to, to answer questions. I would. I love to talk about picking juries. I love to pick, talk about the law, constitutional law, First Amendment law. Uh, in the materials which will be distributed to you digitally after this, I have a paper on the law of jury selection, which could probably use an update, but I still think it's pretty much the state of the art on what the law is of jury selection. Got some other interesting stuff in there. Of course, I think it's interesting. Why would I say it's interesting? I'm going to make you think it's uninteresting by saying it's interesting. There's some other stuff in there which you might like to read. Uh, there, there is a paper about sort of my theory about trying cases and especially picking juries and how jurors' minds work and some of the things that we need to be focused on in, in, in presenting ourselves to juries. It's all about charisma, ultimately. It's about being the guy who is warm, powerful, that is competent, and present, that is right here in the room with you. And if you can do that with your juries, they're going to love you. And if they love you, they're going to do what your clients need them to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Y'all you. Um, know this is a 10-hour CLE. It is all free, and there will be lunch tomorrow. So come back and get the, the remaining five hours. Thank you.